for those facilities and that we can quickly get those facilities outbreaks under control. And you can see um, based on the changing from the orange on the left to the blue on the right, that we've been largely uh, successful at doing that. And that goes to both uh, my staff, but also to those long-term care facilities uh, that have worked really, really hard to make this happen. You can see the two distinct spikes. Um, you'll see it better in our next graph, which should be our five-day rolling average. Um, and you can see that the, the outbreak uh, that we had, th this outbreak I wanted to talk about a little bit more. I think I touched on this last time, um, but it's, it's important to note again that the reason that we want to be really careful about this is because for every single positive case that we have, that case investigation takes two hours. And on average, um, for each positive case, there's four to five close contacts that we need to do follow-ups with. And those close contact investigations can take anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours. So when you have a, a number of cases, when you're getting close to 30, uh, you're talking about a lot of case contacts and a lot of time. And that's where it becomes difficult for our staff to be able to control an outbreak like that and quickly get it under control so it doesn't further spread. We, we had to rely on the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment um, and their staff to help control this outbreak. And it's again, uh, the reason why we really want to pay attention to that social distancing, masking, washing our hands as we move forward. Our trajectory downward, as you can see, um, was pretty steady and it would have uh, likely continued to be steady downward. We're seeing a few more cases that are, not, that are no longer associated with that outbreak, but, uh, but we're, we're still at a pretty low case count comparative to the overall uh, disease uh, uh, timeframe. Next slide. This is the total number of tests per day. Um, and when I start talking about protect our neighbor, one of the measurements is how many tests um, we can, we have the ability to run in the day in Boulder County. And uh, I, I think I shared at previous meetings that our number of projected tests that we should be running are around 500, 4, 495 in our county. We actually have the ability to run much more than that. And we haven't had the need to do so. One of the things that we've needed to do is make sure that we can test all of our symptomatic folks in the county, which we can do, and expand that testing to uh, people who were in close contact with a positive, and we have the ability to do that now um, in multiple places in the county. We don't have the demand to do that, so we're actually in a pretty good place in terms of Boulder County, and we certainly can run more than 500 tests per day. Uh, you can see that just from the, the two places in that graph where we were above 600 in one day, and we know we have capacity in our community to run more if we need to. Part of the challenge right now is that there is a greater number of tests coming in at the state level um, and there is a delay on some of the testing that's coming from both the state and some of the private labs at this point um, and we definitely want to be able to have a handle on that as we move forward into these next months. Next slide. And this is the percent positivity rate basically without going into a lot of the detail behind this what we want to be able to do, and this is one of the measurements in Protect Our Neighbor as well, is we want to be below 5% positivity uh, in Boulder County for a five-day average. And we've been able to maintain that for, for quite some time here, as you can see. Um, what that really means is that if we're below 5%, that means we're testing enough people in our population to know that we're, that we're identifying the majority of the positives that are out there. So as long as we're below 5%, we're in good shape. And uh, again, as you can see here, we have maintained below 5%. Next slide. This is our um, total uh, positives or probables in Boulder County per municipality per 100,000. So it's a case rate. Um, and you can see that um, Boulder's at 497. We've seen uh, a few, we've seen the uptick in Boulder here. Um, you know, a lot of that again associated with. Uh, the outbreak that occurred up on the hill. Um, and, uh, but we have been seeing more cases in Boulder in general. Um, and then second highest, as you can all see here, is in Longmont. Next slide. Uh, uh, this demonstrates um, what we are seeing at a national level as well. So this is the total, total Boulder County residents who've tested positive 
for COVID-19 or, or who are considered probable. And, it's, and it breaks it out by not hospitalized, hospitalized, um, needing uh, intensive care and deceased. And what we're seeing in this graph is that, um, again, the majority of our cases in the 20 to 29 year olds, um, that is the population that we're seeing a lot of new cases in across the nation. Um, associated with a higher mobility when we look at the mobility data. Um, there is less ICU need and less hospitalization need in the younger population. And once you hit the 50 to 59 uh, year old bracket, you start to go up in hospitalizations, ICU and, um, and deaths, um, as, we've, as we all know and we've seen with this virus um, throughout this, the progression of it. Next slide. This is our cumulative hospitalization data across the Denver Metro County area. Um, again, you've seen this multiple times. It just illustrates we are staying um, flat across the, the region in terms of hospitalizations. This is where CDPHE's update, they expect that unless there's some kind of massive change um, that we would continue to see flat numbers as we go into the summer. Um, and one thing that could drive a change just to make sure that I know you're, you're all aware, but people that are in that older age category. So once you're into that 50 to 59 and above at age category, you start to look at hospitalizations and you can see greater numbers of hospitalizations. So um, what would change that is if we had a lot of people was with virus circulating out and about that weren't uh, social distancing, that weren't wearing masks, that weren't paying attention to hygienic practices, um, that could change uh, these hospitalization curves, both this one and the one that I'm gonna show you next. Next slide. Uh, this is our Boulder County hospitalizations that are specific to COVID-19. Uh, we've been on a pretty steady decline. Um, as of around the 1st of July, we saw an uptick um, in hospitalizations associated with COVID. Um, so we do wanna keep an eye on that, but it's still very low comparative. Um, and our numbers have fluctuated between four and eight um, as this last week has, uh, has been going by us. And we're, again, we meet with our hospitals every single week. We make sure that the data that we're seeing on these charts are in fact what they're seeing in the hospitals and we get qualitative information from them as well about what they're seeing, uh, what kind of things they are worried about. So we're able to, to really take these data and, and put them onto the ground with hospitals and make sure we're validating it. Next slide. Uh, this is the state hospitalization data. And um, you can see here that there's a very slight tail up that blue, uh, the blue line is the one uh, that represents the currently hospitalized uh, for confirmed COVID-19 cases. Um, and what we wanna do is make sure again that that blue line stays down and then it doesn't start to go up. Uh, so you'll hear a lot of focus as you've already heard in these last couple of weeks. Um, as well as moving into uh, the rest of the summer is the importance again of social distancing, masking. We know masking makes a difference. Um, a lot more focus on that right now. Goldman and Sachs just published a study about effectiveness of masking and how it could help um, uh, ensure that we don't lose control of the GDP. Um, so a lot more uh, messaging coming around masking and you'll continue to see more of that as we move into the weeks ahead of us. Next slide. This is a, a graph of the number of people who have, um, who have deceased in our county and the orange is associated with long-term care facilities um, and the, the blue are considered non-long-term care facilities. So you can see that again, we have a very low um, rate of death. We wanna keep it that way. Um, we don't, we obviously don't want to lose any more people associated with this disease. Um, and uh, as long as we're following that guidance, we all can do this. Next slide. This is the national data I wanted to highlight briefly. So um, it, it's pretty clear here, this is the United States. We never really went into a sharp decline. Um, we went into a slight decline uh, after, from the start of this. And then we went into an uptick where um, uh, the number of cases that I saw reported on the news today were nearly 50,000. Um, so we are definitely increasing in cases in the United States. When we look at this next slide, 
you can really see the illustration of some of the challenges um, that I think we face uh, going forward. If, uh, and I'm not gonna go through all these, but the ones to, that, that really have really significant increases, if you look at Florida, uh, if you look at California, uh, if you look at Arizona, that one's dramatic. You can see that the uptick in cases that they have in those places alone are much, much, much higher than any time previous um, in this disease path. So uh, it's a pretty big challenge. We don't wanna see that happening um, across states because we know that people can travel from state to state. And if you remember the early part, uh, when we started to see this disease in Colorado, we were starting to, to spread the disease based on travel. Um, and we were able to get that under control, but we had to do it through obviously really difficult and drastic measures like stay at home that none of us want to go back to. Um, so really making sure we're doing everything we can to control this around us is going to be really important. On the very bottom graph there, um, you'll see Colorado about midway ac across, a little bit more than midway across. Uh, Colorado has just a little tail on the end of it, and, and that's where we want to keep it. We don't want that to increase. I think the governor's done a great job uh, of really thinking through um, what's the best progression forward and how do we take smart steps as we move forward um, without uh, getting into something that we can't then control. And the next slide, uh, next two slides, will cover our protect our neighbors. And this is really um, what we just heard about from the governor's office. And there is multiple requirements in order to move to this level. Um, and basically, <clears throat> the major differences between where we are now and uh, this protect our neighbors is that all all sectors can go back to 50%, um, whereas now there's limitations and caps on certain sectors. And there's also a threshold of uh, a total of 500 people in one place and, um, uh, and some other minor changes. But those are the major changes between where we are now and where this threshold is. And uh, this threshold requires a, a series of different things. It, it, there, and with each of these three bullets that you see on here, there's specific measurement levels that we have to track on a, a daily and weekly basis. Before we can actually move to this next level, we have to apply to the state and demonstrate that we can meet these thresholds um, and uh, that we have a plan if we started to go backwards, how we were, what we were gonna do if we do start to go backwards on these thresholds. Um, if you go to the next slide, it requires a lot of approval, which I think, again, is a smart thing because we are invested in this across our communities, um, but it requires local elected leaders, uh, and commissioners, mayors, hospitals, law enforcement, and our emergency management folks, as well as public health, to approve the plan um, that would be the application to go to this next level. Um, and it, as I noted, it, it talks about specific things like how we're gonna assure we meet those guidelines, how we're gonna meet the metrics, um, how we'll increase mask wearing in public settings. Um, uh, they also included influenza vaccine uptake and there's been a lot of focus on this uh, in, at the state level, including some supportive legislation this year because when we, we know when we get to the fall, it's going to be a challenge, um, especially for our hospitals as we start to have flu uh, season in addition to COVID. And those things look a lot alike, as we all know. Um, it's going to be challenging to try to separate the two of them. So doing as much as we can um, to make sure that people are getting flu vaccine and taking that pressure um, off of our healthcare system before we get there is gonna be critically important. So all those things have to be included in that plan as we move forward. Uh, and then the final message I have again is just, we absolutely can do this. We saw in terms of um, the outbreak that we had here locally, how quickly and easily something can happen and how quickly we can have those cases spread to a number of people. Uh, and we want to avoid that at all costs because uh, that threatens our economy. Uh, it threatens our, our society. We all know that there is behavioral health, mental health, physical health impacts with not being able to be outside, not being able to exercise, to have to stay at home, to not being able to socialize. We can do this together, but we have to work hard at it. And we all know that. And for all of you that have been 
watching this uh, over the, the last several months. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the commitment you've made to making sure that our numbers are staying low. Um, we are definitely working um, with the University of Colorado, with City of Boulder, um, to, to really make sure that as our students come back, we're doing it in as safe a way as possible. And I, I can't underestimate, or I can't overemphasize enough how much work has gone into to really making sure that we're doing everything we can to educate and support people, make sure they understand um, how important this virus is. It's still with us. Um, you know, it's, it's not gonna be here forever. We're gonna be able to get through this. There is hope. Uh, at some point we will have a vaccine, it will be available, um, and things will be a little different than they are now. But until we get there, we all have to continue to really work together. Um, and we can we can control this virus if, we, if we're diligent about it. So I will stop there and see what questions you have of me. Very good. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Jeff. As always, your updates are super helpful to us. I currently do not have any hands up. Um, so I'll give a few more moments to see if anyone has any questions. Mary. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I just have one quick question, and it's with regards to an article that I read today regarding um, aerosols. And I'm just wondering um, what information we have regarding um, lingering aerosol in indoor air and um, and how that relates to mask wearing? Uh, there is definitely, uh, I, I have also been hearing about the same thing, but I haven't seen anything um, that has been, I haven't seen anything sent out yet um, from like the CDC or anybody like that. Um, I have heard that aerosols can remain in the air. We, we actually heard that a month and a half ago or so, uh, I think it was uh, Harvard that first did that study and they found that aerosols can, can linger, but there was not a lot of evidence on that being a primary source of spread. So I have heard about it, but I haven't seen um, the latest data. I haven't seen the article today uh, that you were mentioning. Um, so I'll be on the lookout for that. As you all know, we learn new information with this virus on a week to week basis. Um, so as we learn new information, if it looks like we need to change strategies or do something different because of that, the latest research or the latest science, uh, then we get together and we talk about what does that change need to look like? How, because the bottom line is we want to do the best we can to prevent the spread of the disease and, and to uh, support people's safety and, and our society and economy. So um, the, the stuff that I know about associated with masks was a recent research study that was uh, that was done from, I think it was the University of Florida. Um, and we actually have a link on that, or we won't might not be there yet, but we'll have a link on our website to that. And it talks about what different kinds of masks can reduce the spread of somebody who's coughing as an example. Um, and the latest research shows that there is definitely a difference between whether what type of cloth covering you have um, from a cloth covering from a bandana to all the way up to a mask and how those different things control the spread. So that is worth looking at. I'm happy to, to send that directly to you if you'd rather have me distribute it to you, but that is information that I think is useful. And it again reaffirms that this disease can be, uh, can be supported in terms of control along with social distancing and masking uh, and hand washing. Those things are all important tools in this toolbox. And no matter what we do moving forward, those three things are gonna be critical for us. Thank you, Jeff. Great, next I have Mark Wallet. Jeff, that was a great presentation. I wanna thank you for that. Uh, two very quick questions. I assume we're long past the uh, issue of the availability of PPE in our hospitals. Is, is that correct? Um, all of our hospitals, the last time I looked had at least two weeks, which is one of the measurements that we have to also track. Um, for going in to protect our neighbor. And we still do, we're still, we're still tracking that on a weekly basis. Um, but PPE, uh, uh, there is more concerns with PPE because of the outbreaks that we're seeing in the, the, not just the rest of the country, um, but in other, in other nations as well. So we're not out of the woods on PPE at this point. We don't have currently a shortage in Colorado, but there is concerns that we may back, be back in that place again if there's 
significant outbreaks like there is in Florida and Texas across all the United States. So we don't want to get back to that, um, and I hope we don't, but there is some concern, and there has been some conversation. Are we attempting to stockpile? We, the state has been having these conversations. Uh, I can tell you that in Boulder County, we do have additional masks, um, and we do have not just masks, but PPE, um, because gowns were a big shortage at one point. Um, so we do have some stockpile, um, and we are trying to acquire additional stockpile as well. Okay, and my second question is, um, uh, Erie and Superior had very, very low rates, positivity rates. Um, and I'm wondering if there was anything that allows for that or that explains that. I don't know the answer to it, but I can ask our epidemiologists and they, I'm sure they could point me to what we're seeing differently in different places. So as an example, um, we know that we, and outside of um, the university, uh, not university, but the, the outbreak on the Hill. Uh, we know we've had a few small things in businesses. So we've had a few small things in restaurants um, in different places, but those specific outbreaks were nothing that, could, that we didn't expect or couldn't control based on just starting to open things up a little bit more um, than they were earlier. But I don't know why the positivity rate is less specifically in those other towns, but I can ask that question and try to get that information back to all of you. Thanks. I'd, be, I'd just be curious to understand why that is so. Okay. Thanks. Great. Next up is Junie. Can you hear me? Yes. So I'm listening through my phone and then talking to you through my computer. So please bear with me. Um, so you just mentioned earlier uh, that you're working with the university. And I wanted to hear a little bit more. What is, what is it that you are working on? And maybe, I know the last time that you were here, uh, you spoke with us, you mentioned the reporting system. And I, want, I wanted to know how far we are in that process, because you remember when you mentioned there would be an online system where um, people can put in their information and then find out what, what level of risk they are in. And also, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about the reporting and also what is the testing plan for CU because I understand the surrounding regions are quite far from, you know, our campus, but we do have a campus right in the middle of our city. So I think, you know, community members actually have been writing us a lot, wondering what is our plan for August because students will be returning to school. Yeah, so uh, let me start with the monitoring first. So the system that is the system we are planning to use is the state system, and they're not going to make a decision until the middle of July. They had to go out and do a larger procurement, so we won't have access to that application until at least the middle of July at the earliest. So we're still a few weeks away from that, and what that will do is it'll help provide, it allows us, uh, if somebody has symptoms, to put their information into that, the application, and then to get referred to testing, as well as get some follow-up so it automates the process of making contacts quickly with people up front um, and helps save on some of that contact, um, early contact uh, uh, information that's necessary to provide people who may be positive with the virus. Um, but we're still a couple of weeks away from that, unfortunately. Um, and I, I just heard that from the State Health Department today. Um, the second thing I heard uh, you ask was, what's the plan that we're working with CU on? And um, we are working with the city of Boulder and with CU. They, the, although I can't re recite this plan, I know there's 13, uh, it's a 13 point plan that CU is working on with students, not just, um, uh, there's not just outreach to the new students, but there's outreach to students right now who are living up on uh, near the hill in those areas. Um, they're working with landlords directly. Um, there's a plan for new students who are incoming um, to do some training and to provide, as I understand it, to provide, um, they're called COVID kits for the lack of a better word, that includes a curriculum about the importance of the virus, what to know about it, masks, um, some of those kinds of things. And there's 13 different points um, that I've heard CU talk about um, that are included in that plan. So I, I know they've been working 
um, really diligently along with folks uh, at the city of Boulder uh, to really think through that plan. In terms of the testing, and I, I bet Jane could probably add to that because um, that wasn't very comprehensive, but there's a lot of work that's been happening. Um, and then the, in terms of the testing um, with CU students, uh, there was conversation about potentially testing all CU students when they came in. That uh, was, that's been a conversation at the state health department because with symptomatic, so that would be testing asymptomatic students that would be coming in um, to Colorado. And what some other universities has done, maybe let me start there, is they've had people test before they left their states. So they weren't traveling if they were um, tested as positive as an example. Um, and we all know that even though you test positive today, tomorrow I might come down with symptoms because I was just outside that incubation period. So we can't give people the impression that because they test positive, they can then go circulate um, with folks and, and not worry about symptoms or maintaining social distancing or masking. It's really important to continue to do that even if you have a positive test because you could be, I mean, even if you have a negative test because you could be positive a couple of days later. Uh, just as an example. Uh, but the, the reason that there's um, some challenges with testing everybody in state, in addition to what I just said about traveling, is that there's already, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a backlog um, a bit at the state level for running those tests in a timely uh, period, um, both with our private labs as well as with um, the state lab. And if we can't get those tests turned around quickly, then we have people sitting who are potentially positive for multiple days and there's greater risk that they might go back and circulate with people in the community. So we, we need a fast turnaround time. Um, and if we ran all the tests for CU as an example, uh, that would put a huge strain on the system. Uh, so we want, we, we've been having conversations with the state who's gonna have conversations with universities uh, in this next week about how we might approach some of these things together. Hopefully that answered those questions. Is that good? Okay, very good. We got Rachel next. Hi, thanks so much, Jeff, for being here and the presentation. Um, I'm just wondering, what is the easiest way to get testing right now if you are um, uninsured? Like I know some some um, counties have, you know, drive-through testing that's been pretty consistent, and I don't think I've seen that in the city of Boulder. I'm not sure if we have it in the county, but if you just want a really simple drive-through. They don't even ask for your insurance card test. Is there a place to do that in the city of Boulder or in the, the county? I don't, I don't know if there is in the city of Boulder. I'd have to look at our, so we do have all those testing sites, including the criteria for those testing sites. I know we have at least two free sites. One of those is UC Health in Longmont. Um, I know that uh, Clinica provides a sliding scale. So if you can't pay, then you can get the test. And then I believe Salud and Longma, but there may be others. Um, and I would need to look at, we, again, we have that information on our, on our website. And there, if you click on the dot on the website, it'll tell you what the criteria are for that specific testing site. Um, thanks. And I, like, I think the state has like a 211 chart or, or email or website, I guess you can click on and that one has has mislabeled some things in the county and in the city that are not actually available for free drive-through testing so it seems like there's been some glitches in getting the information out to at least city of boulder residents so and rachel if you can shoot me an email and just if just put that if you could just give me any information you have i'll follow up yep. on that. Thank okay you. thanks okay great any other questions i am seeing none so with that, I think we're ready to go to open comment. Thank you, Jeff, so much for being here and for the update. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Sam, the thing we were going to do next is invite Yvette Bowden to talk about our restaurant reopening. Great. Well, I've messed up everything tonight except for the I'm in the agenda. So we'll try and get better from here on out. Welcome, Yvette. Hi. Um, welcome back, Council and my colleagues who are out there. Um, I'm going to quickly just review, as promised, um, cross-departmental work along with our economic development partners as directed by Council is the city's response to the needs of reopening restaurants and retailers. Next slide. Quickly, as a reminder, um, we met with you in May and you specifically suggested that we look at um, looking 
things in response to reopening restaurants and retailers. And it was initially focused on restaurants. Um, they had asked for this in the survey, which you'll recall that we did in late March, which was around um, the business impacts that they were experiencing. And our goals were to specifically address those requests, ease and affordability of pickup and delivery, um, expansion opportunities in light of what we all anticipated, which came to fruition, social distancing and service limitations, including the ability um, to address alcohol licensure and use of the right-of-way. Um, restaurateurs were looking for a clear and speedy process with clarity on specific issues, and they wanted some help in uh, telling people that they were reopening. In addition, the city always considers community safety, equity, quality of life impacts, and city incurred costs. Next slide. So I shared with a, a timeline with you earlier in May to kind of say, how might we do this? And we were all um, expecting a press release from the governor's office. The items in red show you that we did hit all of those dates, if not beat those dates. Um, and it gives you an indication of we're right where we said we would be in July, back speaking with you to give you an update report. Next slide. You also suggested and we implemented several street closure areas in addition to the regular right of way expansion opportunities. So Pearl Street Mall, uh, Pearl Street was closed between 9th and 11, including a portion of 10th, and the University Hill Event Street was closed. Um, they have been activated since that time uh, based on those applications, and uh, so far they are well received. Um, we have not received additional requests for street closures under this program this way. Um, but we have been able to accommodate other types of expansions as the project was implemented. Next slide. So what are the results to date? And I'm showing you now some pictures from the actual pop-ups that have occurred in our community. The last time I presented to you, I showed you samples of what simple um, expansions might look like. Everything you see from here on out in this presentation are things that are actually occurring in Boulder right now. Um, so we implemented the program on time. This slide said, your memo that you received said we received 75 applications. Um, this slide says 79, and now I can tell you we're at 81 as of this evening. Um, that includes a lot of uh, restaurant parklets, 65, but we know that we have several that we have approved. I can tell you that um, we are currently at 81 approved applications. This includes 68 temporary modification of the existing alcohol licensure, and the remainder were for pickup and curbside delivery or retailers. The program was expanded to include retail options within the past couple of weeks, and it is just as simple a process as the other process, but we are able to distinguish, and I can have that in a summary report at the end of the program to tell you how many were retailers and how many were restaurateurs. Throughout the project, we also added curbside enhancements, um, which would allow for people um, to bump out their retail locations or to have additional pickup and delivery, which don't involve necessarily a closure. In early in this process, we were all paying attention to how long we could, uh, how long it would take to review, which is why we really encouraged simplicity in the expansion opportunities. And I believe it was Council Member Wallach who encouraged us to operate within that window of three to five days. I can tell you that our average response time for parklets or expansions is two days. Um, we have not had any that I'm aware of with a full com uh, with a completed expansion application that went longer than that. It is six days for alcohol licensure modification, and that's with a lot of assistance from the state as well and the Sean's awesome team that's processing. Um, against those additional requirements. To date, staff has expended over 1,200 hours of staff time on this project, which is not included in the estimated cost of $74,000, $75,000 um, that is further defined in your memo. Next slide. So I'm just giving you some happiness shots. Uh, this is sort of uh, pictures from around town 
of what some of the parklets look like. We want to thank all of the restaurants and retailers who have been along this journey with us, um, as well as our many partners in the Boulder Response um, and Recovery Alliance that are making this possible through education, through outreach um, and coordination. Um, I also want to thank all of my colleagues in the other departments involved in this um, that it really has taken many, many departments um, and lots of partner support to do it. I'm also highlighting on here uh, some of the outstanding work that's still going on from everything from what uh, the Convention and Visitors Bureau is doing to um, highlight dining safely and to promote uh, responsible visitation in Boulder so that people know what to expect and to tell people what's open. In downtown Boulder, Love the Local has a specific dining website as well. And the Hill Boulder is also promoting this for their businesses as well on the Event Street and in the University Hill area. So you see there some things around town, some things on private property, in uh, parking lots, some things on curbsides and in the right of way. Next slide. So what have we learned? Um, and I'm just going to fly through these and welcome your questions at the end of the presentation. Um, obviously, we have had to uh, balance a lot of regulatory requirements with um, appreciating what we wanted to be that simple applicant experience. Um, a key to this has been keeping the parklets simple. Um, if and as we went down a road, for example, of more complicated structures in the right of way, we do anticipate that that would be a complication. We know that seasonal street closure is desired by many members of the community for many reasons. And we have learned and, and reiterated in the memo to you um, that we have to consider safety, uh, the floodplain, access points, balance interests, because not everyone has always agreed in what they wanted on their block face, city incurred expense and revenue abatement, and frankly, the creation of a great place to visit which has to be, at this time, safe, always safe. Community engagement and partner organizations have contributed to this. Um, I mentioned before uh, the Convention of Visitors Bureau, Downtown Boulder and the Hill, uh, the Chamber, um, the Latino Chamber, SBDC, everyone has been involved in this um, to help people understand how to do it, how to get the information to convert applications to Spanish, and to get the information out to the visiting public. There are some issues and discoveries that we will want to continue to look at for the rest of this program. One is what role might arts and culture further play? Uh, and what have we learned about how they played in the implementation of this? And thank you to Matt Shazansky and David Farnan and their team um, for their efforts in this area. Food trucks were invited to participate, but did not have to process these applications. So we don't have great information on how they've participated along the road here, but it's certainly something we can do outreach to find out. We wanna understand the fiscal impacts, but they aren't discoverable yet. So how many businesses, um, what did that do for them? You know, Were they able to get more people? What has the visitation rate been like? Has that varied? if you were not in a densely populated area of restaurants. And then what happens when we look at other closure purposes when we're no longer in a COVID environment, whether that be construction, special events, walks, runs, and races, and other things that make the community so great. Next slide. So um, with your permission um, and your support, uh, the close of the pro the application window is approaching on July 17th. Uh, right now we're scheduled to return Pearl Street's bus route um, and remove the temporary closure infrastructure in October. Um, and we would do, and we would continue to work on the experience evaluation and data capture, as well as our ongoing work with the Alliance collaborative efforts. And with that, I'll end and take any questions you have. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Yvette, very much. <clears throat> um, council members, if you have questions, now's a good time. I've got Bob and then Mark. Up. Yvette, thanks for that presentation. And I think, um, you know, one of the lessons that I think we all learned as a community is, is how quickly we can move when we really need to, right? 
Um, we were, as you as you all remember, we were in a, in a pretty desperate situation in mid to late May where businesses were literally going under and, and we needed to figure out how to take advantage of the governor's opening, reopening of the restaurants uh, and, and retail stores so that they could um, get back to business, get their employees back to work, um, generate sales, generate sales tax, um, but also do that in a safe way. And um, I, I really appreciate uh, the, the work of so many staff members in planning and economic vitality and licensing and so many other departments, police and fire, who had to come together um, and really in a cross-disciplinary and collaborative way, figure out how to get this done and, and literally in, in a matter of days and then turn these applications in you know 48 hours, that's fantastic. And so I think not only should we compliment staff um, for all the fantastic and hard work that they did uh, in the late spring and continuing to today in making this successful, but I think it's also worth an opportunity for us maybe in the fall to do a, 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 a deep dive, a debrief, to evaluate what other um, regulatory barriers that do we put up as a city to all sorts of uh, endeavors in our community um, and figure out, use this as an example to cut through some of the red tape. Um, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to um, not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I, I think I'd like us as, as, as city staff and city council um, as the uh, hopefully the coronavirus uh, experience fades and we get a vaccine and uh, we get life back to, to normal. I hope we can use this particular experience as a case study for how the city can act nimbly and quickly and cut through uh, regulatory hurdles and eliminate regulatory barriers to uh, business and community building. So I, um, I compliment staff, but I also want to use this as an opportunity for us to learn on how we can make the city a better partner to our community going forward. Thanks. Thank you. So then I have Mark and Mary and Rachel. Mark, oh, Mark dropped off. <clears throat> Mark, do you have oh, a comment? Yes, I do. Um, first, I want to second Bob's comments uh, to you, Yvette, and your staff. Uh, I think the job that you did under difficult circumstances and in short order was, was absolutely first rate. It's really quite astonishing. It is very easy for us to um, say at, at, at council level that we'd like you to move quickly and, and do the impossible, um, but it was up to you to do it. And I think you have met every reasonable expectation that we could have had in this program. I think it is just fabulous. Um, I do have a couple of, of short questions. Um, one, are we tracking um, data with respect to uh, restaurant closures, either temporarily or permanently, um, so that we know what we're seeing out there. And by the same token, do we have any data that is looking at um, possible eviction proceedings against restaurants to, to see what the magnitude of that might look like as the courts begin to open up? And my last question is, um, any thoughts of extending that application deadline? Do, do we think we're gonna be leaving anybody out of the parade by cutting it off on, on July 17th. Thanks for your questions and for your feedback. I'll pass it along to everybody who's Please been working do. on this. Please In do. terms of, I will. In terms of the tracking on closures, um, we do not typically track this kind of thing. I will tell you that as part of our economic vitality function, obviously we're on high alert. Um, and so one of the things that I've been working on with Cheryl Catelli's team and particularly Joel Wagner is looking for things that are surrendered licensees or things like that, which will be an indicator of whether or not, um, and you know, our partners are so, so great at knowing what's happening on the ground. Um, we are not hearing that at this time. One of the things we'll also be looking at is sales tax revenue generation, right? Um, and so I would imagine that we'll have that toward the end but in a more immediate space, um, it's really happening by word of mouth, people getting in contact with myself and staff and partners to chat through what they're experiencing. And it, it really is across the gamut. I was on the phone with one restaurateur last night. So um, who's not closing, but is interested in exploring some other things. Um, and our partners are doing a great job in that. In terms of eviction proceedings, I just wanna remind council of the work that the chamber did early on with the commercial real estate industry 
um, who, from what we're told anyway, have been holding to that uh, thought, nobody wants vacancies, and we've all been trying to work with tenants, including the city. Um, these are difficult times, though, as, as those commercial property owners and the city itself has expenses to cover. So I can tell you that it's being watched. Um, I'm not hearing outcries yet, but I also know that businesses are making hard decisions well before those decisions. Um, and so it's really a, a decision, not necessarily about eviction and more about whether or not they can afford to continue as the pandemic um, kind of, you know, the recovery time. I won't even call this a recovery time for restaurant and real retailers right now. I will call it um, an exploration of what they're going to do to see if they can make it. And so particularly the SBDC has been working and the chamber has been working on helping people re-navigate and resituate their business models. What kind of staff can you afford? What kind of space can you be in? And we'll be looking at that and, and have been looking at that not only locally, but with our county colleagues. And um, I don't know if anybody's listening from Denver, but I have really appreciated the conversations that I've been able to have with my peers in other cities as well. Uh, because it really is going to be a phenomenon that affects the entire state. Your last question was about the deadline. Um, and I, I don't really think of it as a deadline. Um, we've been thinking about it more like what would it take for us to execute. And, um, and so we don't think we're leaving anybody out. Um, there has not been a rush. Uh, we did have some recent applications. And we think that, you know, is a mixture of retailers and some people who are just starting to reopen. Um, but, you know, I, I think that, you know, one of the things that we wanted to continue to do is listen to the community. Um, and so we haven't heard a request for that yet, uh, but we're always learning and certainly would act accordingly if we saw that. Yvette, thank, thank you. you. And terrific job. Thanks. Thank you. Great, and then we have Mary and Rachel. Mary? Oh, thank you, Yvette. And I want to echo um, Bob's and Mark's praises of your and um, your staffs and all as well as all other staffs work. Um, totally phenomenal. So thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is has to do with if anyone who applied and received um, the go ahead to open did not for whatever reason end up going through with it. We're not aware of that. Um, we are aware of some people who opened, closed and opened again, um, and or are completely, re you know, kind of continuously refining what their needs are. Um, and so we've tried to be uh, thoughtful around that. I am not aware of people um, with few exceptions that decided, that completed an application were awarded an applicant, you know, that were approved for their permit and then decided not to move forward. Um, and by the way, the commercial, the private property owners have been, ex they love the sample letter and there have been no problems with people getting approval from their private property owners that I'm aware of. So, I mean, everything that we could do to move out of the way has been done. Uh, we are not aware of people deciding that they did not want to go through with that application. Thank you. Sure. Great. And then Rachel and Junie. Rachel? Okay. Hi, Beth. Thanks. Um, this has been a, a great program. I've enjoyed uh, several uh, outdoor parklets and street closure spots. So I think you guys did a phenomenal job. Um, so my, I've got one data question. When, you know, we, we got some pushback, I think, for closing on um, East Pearl because retail was concerned about it. So I'm wondering if we're collecting data on, um, I guess, revenue or sales tax collected um, in, on blocks where the street was completely closed versus parklets. And also, are we collecting data on um, the retail that, were on, that are on those blocks? Like, did it help or hurt? those retailers? So great questions. And we do anticipate that we'll be able to get information on that as the sales tax is 
reported and collected. Okay. Um, we do not have that information today. Um, and as you know, to accommodate the openings and expansions on the east side, we did not close, but we rerouted the bus. And that um, has bode well with the restaurateurs on that side and the retailers alike. So we're hearing only anecdotal feedback at this point, but I can certainly seek to get you some of that information in a final summary report at, you know, after the program closes. Awesome, thanks. Um, and I understood that, that you don't have the data yet, so I should have specified that. And then um, also, I know that we must have talked about this in April or May, but why did we choose um, September 30th, 30th or October 1st as the time when we would revert? Because we're still gonna have COVID, it's still gonna be pretty warm ish right well you know, one of the things is the crystal ball right so just as our county friends have described and we've been benchmarking across cities and there's a benchmark report attached to your memo that kind of shows you how long most of the programs were most of our uh, competitors were going with a fixed 120 days um and we didn't know what else would happen we were also thinking about some of the safety issues um with a turn of the weather and frankly, a return of any on-street revenue. Uh, we wanted to think about that and the return of the student population and hopefully workforce, because we weren't sure whether people were gonna be coming back to their offices. All of these things are economic indicators that we wanna keep our eye on. Um, and we're not sure yet whether or not businesses have an interest of going further than that as weather turns and it gets windy or rainy. I know I was out there one day when it started to come down and uh, and we weren't sure what was happening with all of the umbrellas and napkins and things like that. But um, we just want to remain flexible and listening at this time and we certainly would do that. So it could get pushed out to say November 1st if there were interest and in indicators that that would help? I would like to work with our partners and discover whether or not there's interest. I also don't want to negatively impact um, what's going on with some of the private properties. Um, and so I just wanted to, you know, be thoughtful about that as well. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Great. Junie? Hi, Yvette. Um, Hi. I just have a quick question and I just wanted to echo everything that was said. I had the opportunity to go actually on Pearl Street a couple of weekends ago and I had dinner outside and I have to say it was fabulous and I loved it. Uh, the experience made me feel as if I had traveled to Europe, although I was right here in Boulder. So that was greatly appreciated. Uh, I think my question is similar to the question asked by Mark, because you mentioned that outside of Pearl in the Hill, other restaurants were not taking um, advantage of the opportunity. We just haven't seen as many in a concentrated area. Sorry? We just haven't seen as many in a concentrated area. So you don't have them as densely populated, but they're out there. Okay, okay, perfect. That, that was my question because I was wondering as well, you know, why and also do, do we regulate indoor crowding in Boulder? So it's Especially really, in, right now. Right, so it's really, we're following the county's guidance and I think you just heard about that. And at this point, there are interior service um, limitations um, and as long as that stays in place, they can only have a certain, a certain amount of seating inside um, for service. We've been following along with the county and really trying to follow that health related lead. Um, I do know that there are several restaurants that are preparing um, for greater capacity inside and being hopeful in that vein. Uh, but we, we just are waiting for county and state direction there. Thank you. Sure. Okay, well, I see no more hands up. Um, <clears throat> if that's everything we've got on this subject, thank you very much, Yvette. I won't repeat everything that all the other council members have said, but this is a very impressive program that you've headed up. So thank you very much.
Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And thank you, Sarah, for flipping slides. Appreciate you. Bye. Okay. So, Debbie and Jane, I think we're on to open comment, but um, hopefully third time's a charm. Is that right? Yes, we are. Very good. So for open comment, we'll have two minutes per speaker. <clears throat> and I have the first three speakers as Abigail Bradshaw, Carlos Alvarez Aranos, and Chelsea Castellano. So we'll start with Abigail. I will need just one moment, Mayor, to queue up the time clock if you could give me one second on the other computer. You bet. <clears throat> yes, tonight Sarah is doing double duty for us. Um, both running the presentation computer as well as hosting the Zoom meeting for us. So, thank Did you, you Sarah. Say two, two minutes a piece, okay. yeah. And then for the public hearings, it will be three minutes a piece. But there's enough for open comment. It's two minutes. Okay, I won't actually start the clock until we have the person ready to speak. So if you wanted to start with the list of names, that would be wonderful. Great, I've done the first three and Abigail is our first speaker, Abigail Bradshaw. Okay, Abigail, you should be able to unmute yourself and speak. Yep, can you hear me? You can. Okay, great. Hi, Council. Um, my name is Abby and I'm a Boulder resident. I'm here to voice my support for defunding and abolishing the Boulder Police Department. As has been discussed many times, the 2019 budget for the Boulder Police Department was over $37 million. The approved 2020 budget adds over $2 million um, to that. I would specifically like to draw your attention to the $360,000 bomb truck listed in, the, listed in the budget, which will also have $24,000 per year of upkeep costs. It's fascinating to me that the Boulder Police Department needs to purchase a new armored bomb truck when the department cannot even tell us how often the old one was used. Could Mayor Harold give any justification for needing the equipment? Additionally, in future plans, the police department hopes it will build an addition to their police station costing 25 to $30 million, buy new bomb robots that will cost up to $635,000 and buy two new bomb suits at $35,000 each. In a city with rampant inequality and segregated housing, it's astonishing that city council majority believes the solution to our problems is increasing funding to a militarized police force that includes violent officers like Waylon Lolatai. As Lupita Montoya said in last night's planning meeting, everyone in Boulder is looking out for themselves and their houses. We have no community. I've witnessed and experienced the violence and military style tactics used by police forces against their communities across the US and in Colorado. The covert racism in Boulder lives in the form of denying housing opportunities to those who can't meet the ever rising income levels and funding the militarized police who target non-white residents and residents experiencing homelessness. Boulder is a community which is only welcome to a select few and changing that must be a priority. Council, I urge you to not take the route of some Aurora city council members and filtering emails and silencing conversations about the police department. Wealthy homeowners may be able to donate more money to campaigns and influence more opinions, but they are not the only residents and community members of Boulder. The terms of Mayor Weaver and council members Nagel, Swetlick, Wallach, and Young are up in 2021. We demand changes to reduce inequality and discrimination. Otherwise, we'll gladly work to replace you with more progressive and inclusive council members. Defund and abolish the police. Thank you. Thank you, Abigail. Uh, Carlos Alvarez Aranos, Chelsea Castellano, and Claudia Team. Carlos is next. Uh, thank you, Council. Carlos, you just muted yourself. Someone muted you. Sorry. Um, my name is Carlos. I come with two hats. I'm a Boulder resident and the owner of Boulder Transport, a company that I started here from nothing and is that is now the primary private transportation provider here in the city. And as the, uh, I do a communication strategy for Protect Democracy, which is a national group. You may have seen uh, the feature in Time Magazine and this week's Time about our work to combat uh, rising authoritarianism in the United States. Um, I, I will split my comments into two. The first deals with uh, some of the actions by council with relation to petitions and signature gathering. Uh, early in the process, we identified uh, a problem with the signature gathering processes and the demands of council uh, and of the state, frankly, that uh, that be done in person. We've seen uh, problems added to that recently with uh, petitioners receiving uh, incorrect information from the city and having to sort of 
hope that council puts their petitions on the ballot, uh, even though they did exactly what they were told to do. My comment, uh, as somebody who works on issues of democracy all the time, is that we, are, we don't want to become the problem we're trying to address. In my work, obviously, I'm constantly dealing with Trump and Barr and states like Oklahoma that have systemic issues. And I just want to warn the council about having Colorado and Boulder specifically become uh, an enemy of the efforts to protect our democracy by not by by creating such walls to petitioners that they can't get their petitions on the ballot. I understand council doesn't agree with the petitions, but you can't use coronavirus as a pocket veto for issues you disagree with. That would be wrong. And then secondly, as a minority business owner in this town, I would also ask why Boulder doesn't have a minority certification uh, process for minority for contracting in, in city and, and county contracts. It's amazing to me that Denver uh, values minority businesses, but Boulder ignores that completely. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. <clears throat> Chelsea Castellano, Claudia Team, and Darren O'Connor. Chelsea? Great, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Chelsea Castellano, an organizer with Bedrooms Are For People, a ballot initiative that would make it legal for one person to live in each bedroom of a home. I wanna share with you why our team of more than 50 volunteers has been able to overcome every extreme obstacle thrown our way. It's not because we are well-funded, we're not, or because we're professional campaigners, we're not. It is because our ballot measure addresses an urgent issue that the community is demanding we fix. Don't take it from me, take it from the 5,000 plus Boulder voters who have already signed our petition and from the Emergency Family Assistance Association, EFA, Better Boulder, Boulder Progressives, United Campus Workers Colorado, the Boulder County Democratic Party, all have decided to formally support our initiative being on the ballot because they know our community will be better once this archaic and discriminatory law is overturned. That's why we have been risking our lives to bring about this change. Fight for the single mother we met who wants to rent out her spare bedrooms to help pay her mortgage, for the young couple we met with a newborn who are going to live in an over-occupied home because that is how they can afford to live here. We hope you join us to give equal housing opportunities for all Boulderites. We hope you join us in fighting for those who have chosen to serve as a nurse or teacher or artist or nonprofit worker or grad student working to combat climate change. We hope you join us in fighting for the freedom to choose who we can live with in our own homes. And we hope you join us in unraveling these discriminatory housing laws that have worsened the inequities Boulder faces today. We are on the right side of history, the side fighting for liberty and justice for all. As our elected representatives, we hope you join us, but at the very least, we hope you respect our community's right to direct democracy and refer our measure to the 2020 ballot. Thank you, Chelsea. <clears throat> Next I have up. a question. I just have a clarification, if I may. Um, so Chelsea, thank you for that. You mentioned that you spoke to a single mother um, that would like to rent out her rooms. Um, if you could communicate with her and let her know that she can have up to two boarders. So she could rent to, um, if she's got two extra bedrooms, she can rent to two boarders. So um, yeah, she, knows, she should not be limited in that right now. She Yes, and she knows that. And she is trying to also put in an ADU so that she can have an ADU in her basement and um, two boarders in her main house. So that would make her over occupied. Um, okay, thank well, thank you. I just, uh, yeah, I, I didn't get that from your comment, but um, thank you. Great. Mm -hmm. Next up, Claudia team, Darren O'Connor and David Prowl the third. Claudia. Hi, good evening, members of council. My name is Claudia Hansen Thiem. I am speaking tonight on behalf of Boulder Progressives a grassroots organization committed to protecting human rights and advancing social and environmental justice at the local level. We wanted to share with you and the community our decision to support the Bedrooms Are For People initiative to reform housing occupancy limits in Boulder. We support this measure for so many reasons. First, because it removes family and relationship status from occupancy regulations, and in doing so, it opens up more housing options to people who are not part of traditional heteronormative families. Second, because it recognizes that sharing homes is a common affordability strategy for young adults and working class people, 
And we want these members of our community to have access to housing in all Boulder neighborhoods. Third, because it legalizes many informal home sharing arrangements already occurring in our community, it increases housing security for many of our vulnerable neighbors. And finally, because it makes more efficient use of Boulder's existing housing stock, which both reduces our environmental impacts and stretches our increasingly precious affordable housing dollars. All of these things support Boulder Progressive's goals of achieving secure and affordable housing for all members of our community and of creating more integrated and environmentally sustainable neighborhoods in Boulder. We appreciate the efforts of dozens of volunteers to gather signatures for Bedrooms Are For People, and we share their conviction that this reform belongs in the city charter. Housing rights should not be subject to easy withdrawal or reversal. And while we're talking housing tonight, we'd also like to congratulate the organizers of the No Evictions Without Representation campaign, which was certified eligible for the November ballot yesterday. We're excited about both measures and we're looking forward to a robust and long overdue campaign for housing justice this fall. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. <clears throat> Next we have Darren O'Connor, David Prowl III, and Eric Budd. Darren? Hi, this is Darren O'Connor. I'm a longtime attorney. I'm an attorney and longtime resident of Boulder. I speak tonight asking each of you to give serious consideration to the joint recommendations of the Human Relations Commission and Housing Advisory Board regarding homeless policies in Boulder. At their joint meeting, members of these two bodies rightfully challenged the veracity of the data and conclusions about homelessness that city staff provided to them. One member went so far as to say staff's documents respectfully should be thrown in the trash. The HRC and HAB recommendations call for, among other things, more bathrooms, an increase in shelter beds, safe parking, sanctioned camps, and inclusion of people with lived experience of homelessness in oversight of homeless policy moving forward. Our entire community deserves the benefits of City Council adopting these recommendations. After community members challenged the city for lack of restrooms and hand washing stations during the COVID pandemic, city staff shared that many bathrooms are publicly available. An important one near the former shelter off 30th Street, the bathrooms at Mapleton Ballfields, we were told, would open in April. <clears throat> Today, I saw for myself that that bathroom is closed. And despite scorching temperatures, the drinking fountain is turned off. Lack of accessible bathrooms, clean water, and hand washing stations continues to be an issue just as the pandemic and need for publicly available sanitation does. In 2016, before the new homelessness strategy for Boulder was implemented, 350 shelter beds were available in Boulder. Today, that number is 110, a decrease of 69%. The strategy is apparently take it away and they will leave. Concurrently, homelessness has increased for the annual point in time count. Clearly the strategy is not working. I urge city council to adopt the recommendations of HRC and HAB, which recognize the need to treat our unhoused neighbors with dignity. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Um, next up, we have David Prowl III, Eric Budd, and Evan Rabbits. So according to our moderator, we don't see David here. Is David here? If not, um, we'll move on to Eric Budd, and if David Prowl joins the meeting, we will let him slot in at the end. So Eric Budd, you're up. Thank you, Council. Uh, my name is Eric Budd with Bedrooms Are For People, and we are working to reform Boulder's discriminatory occupancy limits. You can join over 5,000 Boulder residents by signing our petition. Please visit bedroomsareforpeople.com. The United Campus Workers of Colorado, Local 799, has endorsed Bedrooms Are For People as a, as a campaign to improve housing options for the university's diverse workforce. That includes part-time and full-time university staff, faculty, graduate and undergraduate laborers. The mission of the United Campus Workers of Colorado is to champion and defend the interests and well-being of all university labor as well as to build and sustain social and economic justice in our workplaces and in our communities. The University of Colorado is a central part of Boulder's community and vibrance. Each year that passes, new faculty and graduate students have a more difficult time living in Boulder and planting roots in Boulder. In addition to the lack of housing options, Boulder's policy of housing discrimination hurts family formation. 
without the ability to establish stable, affordable community housing, few people have options to start to even start a family in Boulder. Boulder's laws have clear cut examples of housing discrimination. The bedrooms are for people measure helps prevent that discrimination and that's why we need the change in the city's charter. Both the city council and our team know that we must do more than only relax occupancy rules to tackle Boulder's numerous housing challenges. Please help us by passing bedrooms are for people this November as we continue to make Boulder a more welcoming and open to all people. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. <clears throat> Next, we have Evan Rabbits, Ermine Nagormeyer, and Jackie Richardson. Evan, you're up. Good evening. First, I urge City Council to follow the 10 recommendations of the Human Relations Commission and the Housing Advisory Board for the Homeless including establishing campgrounds, parking lots, and tiny home villages. Please do it before the coming flood of evictions and homelessness. Second, city council should be speaking up for our scientific community by protesting CU firing Dr. Detlev Helmig for exposing the poisoning of the front range by oil and gas operations. The city did help former council member and scientist Lisa Morzell, when she lied at a council meeting in 2011 to justify the city's supporting construction of the so-called Plutonium Parkway by removing that city council video from the city website. Every citizen should see it. I've put it online at tinyearl.com slash boulderlie. That's tinyurl.com slash boulderlie. The city took action to protect the lying of one of your own. Take action to protect the truth of Dr. Helmut. Last and least, regarding performance reviews of the city attorney and city manager, as I've been saying for six months, they should be fired for lying to council and cheating the citizens. I put video, audio, and documentary proof at tinyearl.com slash petition story. That's tinyurl.com slash petition story. Please see slides 13 and 14 first. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. <clears throat> Next, we have Ermine Nomir, Jackie Richardson, and Jamie Morgan. Ermine? <clears throat> Thank you so much to the council for allowing me to speak. This is Ermine Nomir, and thank you for that. I want to discuss really elevating housing solutions for those of us in Boulder County in the greatest needs. We had some recommendations recently come out from the Housing Relations Commission and Housing Advisory Board, and they included the following high-level recommendations. I won't go into the specifics, but at first priority, the need to create an oversight committee. Secondly, restoring path to home funding and really support for the bridge house. I like the and solution. Provide essential services, including more bathrooms and food services. Commit to current data and additional data points every 30 days. Reopen faith-based community shelters and services for the first six months in support of coordinated entry. Increase the number of availability of beds throughout the city to accommodate the need, including the expansion of availability for severe weather sheltering. Decriminalize homelessness and move the homeless outreach team and associated resources. People often say, how do we pay for this? My response of late has been very simple. Defund the police department and really any um, public safety uh, realms out there that have been over resourced. I grew up in Boulder, played ball and had some phenomenal coaches and they really hammered home a couple of critical notions for us. In that space, it was all about integrity, that lesson that we are all only as strong as our weakest link and not to compound mistakes. I'm going to assume all of you guys here on, on um, council have the integrity part, right? And when we look at um, compounding our weakest, uh, not compounding our weakest, excuse me, not compounding our mistakes, 
I just hope that we've made some in the past, we learn from them and can move forward. We need to take care of those of us that are the weakest and I hope we can ramp that up. Thank you. Thank you, Armin. <clears throat> we have Jackie Richardson, Jamie Morgan and Julie Zanheiser. Jackie. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, so I think Armin actually took a lot of my talking points already. Um, <laughs> but I'm here to ask you to take funding away from Boulder PD and put it towards homeless services by decriminalizing homelessness in Boulder. This issue is especially urgent right now due to the merciless logic of our country's response to the COVID crisis. Much of the economy is still shut down, which means many people are still scrambling to make rent or will be soon. Housing assistance is starting to run low and we're facing an oncoming tsunami of evictions. Potentially thousands of Boulderites will become homeless and the existing shelters do not have anywhere near enough capacity, especially with social distancing requirements in place and with the 30th street shelter currently shut down. Many, many more people will be sleeping on the streets by later this year. Unfortunately, taking steps to survive this traumatizing upheaval is still criminalized since Boulder's camping ban is still in place. Boulder's 2020 budget gives $38.6 million to the police and only a little over $1 million for homeless services, um, which is a frankly embarrassing ratio. Um, we need to change these numbers by defunding the police and moving that money to homeless services. Um, although Boulder does have a housing first program in place, it could be much, much bigger and better funded. Um, and I'd like to bring up the example of Finland, which decided a little over a decade ago to um, take the stance that nobody should be sleeping on the streets because housing is a human right. And they put this into practice by building or buying apartments and making them available to the unhoused without preconditions. As a result, they're now saving $16,000 per year per previously homeless person, showing that it's far more cost effective to try to prevent or end homelessness rather than to manage it. I urge city council to cut the bloated BPD budget and use that money in a way that will actually do some good for the community. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. <clears throat> Next, Jamie Morgan, Julie Zahnheiser, and Kurt Nordbeck. Jamie? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Jamie from SAFE. Today we released a video exposing Boulder PD Officer Waylon Lolatai's personal Instagram account, which he uses to share videos of police brutality with glowing praise, casual homophobia, and COVID-19 denial. To catch you up to speed, Lola Tai was put under investigation while working for Denver PD for attacking an inmate who said something he didn't like. He resigned from Denver PD before the investigation could finish, and because we only deal with the best here, he was hired by Boulder PD. Mr. Lola Tai has since made the news several more times for attacking Kelly Clark, a small middle-aged woman who was watching him detain an unhoused man on, Pearl, on the Pearl Street Mall. Sammy Lawrence, the disabled black man who was filming Lolotai at the required eight foot distance when he was engaging with some unhoused residents, and Michelle Rodriguez, who was sitting on a wall and requested someone higher up because she felt she was being unfairly treated. The charges against Ms. Rodriguez and Ms. Clark were unsurprisingly dropped while Sammy's case is still ongoing. Mr. Lolotai was one of the officers who showed up to intimidate Zade Atkinson for picking up trash while black. In one post on Lolotai's account, he shares footage that starts with an unarmed man being held in a chokehold by an officer. Another officer climbs on top of him and starts punching the man in the face while he lies there unable to move. Eventually, another officer comes and puts his knee on the man's neck, very similar to how George Floyd was murdered by Minneapolis PD. Lola Tai writes, it made me happy that she, being the officer, was dropping bombs on his stupid face. There's a lot more of this on his account, which you can see at Tactical Toa, T-O-A, on Instagram, or in our video titled Boulder PD Officer Lola Tai's Disturbing Instagram Account Revealed on YouTube. Lola Tai should have never been hired, and he should have been fired after each time one of his attacks was made known. Here's your opportunity to begin to approach justice for his victims by firing Lola Tai, keeping his position vacant, and defunding BPD. Thank you, Jamie. <clears throat> Next, we have Julie Zahnheiser, Kurt Nordbeck, and Michael Holtz. Julie, you're up. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. 
Um, uh, I guess you can start the timer if you like. Um, Mayor Weaver, Mayor Pro Tem Yates, and council members, my name is Julie Zahnizer. I live in South Boulder. As you strive to position Boulder for the best energy future, your decision whether or not to negotiate a long-term agreement with Excel at this time may leave a legacy that could endure long after you have left council. We are in the midst of multiple crises. I urge you to hit the pause button and hold off on a decision in order to make an informed decision. I have five points. Number one, even in the face of severe city budget shortfalls, it is more important to not rush into an agreement than to hastily negotiate one. A hurried agreement always favors the side with more resources. Please keep in mind city goals, Excel's goals, and business model and Excel's formidable legal and financial resources for preparing an agreement to maximally benefit and protect the company. Number two, council needs more information in order to make a decision whether or not to negotiate. Council members need to learn of previous council's experiences with Excel, many regulatory and legal constraints, and potential cost and lost opportunities. Number three, council who were unable to attend listening sessions need to hear the complex and varied input pro and con from 44 citizens. Please review city listening session summaries, which ca capture much of what was said. For example, you will learn from Excel's slides that its proposed renewable technologies include costly, unproven at scale, natural gas, carbon capture and storage, and expensive advanced nuclear generation. Number four, there's no reason to make a hasty decision this summer. Per Colorado Revised Statute 40-3-16-106, we will continue to receive the same services as the rest of Excel's customers without an agreement, just as we do now. Excel will always be willing to make a deal with Bold. This is a highly volatile issue. Voter engagement and education takes more than a couple of months. Thank you for your attention and for your hard work on our behalf. Thank you, Julie. Um, next up, Kurt Nordbeck, Michael Holtz, and Patrick Murphy. Kurt? Kurt, we can't hear you if you're speaking. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm Kurt Nordbeck. I'm a resident of Boulder. We all know that efficient use of resources is key to environmental sustainability. That means building our city so most trips don't require a car. It means minimizing thirsty private lawns that benefit only a few. It means making it legal and economically viable to create more smaller homes rather than fewer larger ones and it means using space effectively in the large houses we have. That's why I support Bedrooms Are For People. Using our housing more efficiently means better use of the embodied energy in the structures and less energy that needs to go into new buildings. It means more efficient use of operational energy as residents share heat and lighting, and it allows people to live closer to their work or school, reducing the transportation emissions that, by sector, are the country's largest contribution to climate change. Boulder has a reputation for environmental sustainability. The reputation is well-deserved in many ways. We're a leader in waste reduction, have ambitious climate goals, and carry on a robust educational program around sustainability. But our land use policies are in large degree an environmental failure, and their harms fall disproportionately on the poor, the underprivileged, and people of color. These are the people forced to endure long polluted commutes because there's no place in Boulder for them to live. As the climate changes, most of us in Boulder can crank our air conditioners and run the sprinklers a little longer, while others will feel the effects of flood, drought, fires, and rising seas much more acutely. So Bedrooms Are For People is about environmental sustainability and about environmental justice. Please join me in supporting this common sense initiative. People need it and the earth needs it. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. <clears throat> Next, Michael Holtz, Patrick Murphy, and Paul Coleman. Michael? My name is Michael Holtz, and I've lived in Boulder since 1978. I'm an architect and I've worked in the field of energy and environmental research and design since 1972, including senior management and research positions at the Solar Energy Research Institute, Architectural Energy Corporation, and Light Louver LLC, which I founded and currently manage. 
Some of you may have read my recent open forum piece in the Daily Camera. The point I made in this opinion piece and would like to make tonight is that many consequential things in life take time to overcome many entrenched positions, especially when for-profit corporations are involved whose primary mission is to maximize profits for their, for their stakeholders. Like others in Boulders, uh, I urge you to hit the pause button and not proceed with deciding whether or not to negotiate a long-term franchise agreement with Excel Energy. It seems to be understood as a binary decision, Excel Energy or municipalization. This is not the case, but this is, this is, we'll save this for later a discussion. Here are a few reasons why a decision on long-term finance agreement should not be put on hold. Any long-term franchise agreement will constrain the city's ability to achieve its climate action goals. The city needs to gain full and complete control over its electric service, have more aggressive transition to sustainable and renewable energy sources, and lower costs for all city customers. Second, any long-term agreement will hamstring the city from accepting a better deal as competition is coming into Colorado over the next few years. City residents and businesses get the same services without franchise agreement as we would with a franchise agreement. So nothing is gained. So what's the big rush? We are in the midst of a multiple crises and it's not, it's not the time to, to be making any such consequential decisions that will impact the citizens of Boulder for decades to come. The community needs time to engage in this matter. And again, I urge you to hold off this decision regarding the uh, XL franchise negotiations. Thank you. Michael, <clears throat> next up, Patrick Murphy, Paul Coleman, and Professor KK Duvivier. Um, Patrick. My name is Patrick Murphy. I live in Boulder. I hope negotiations with Excel are going well, and Boulder has added a level of humility to compensate for the incredibly bad history of the Muni effort that is more of a propaganda effort than a critical evaluation representing Boulder citizens. About half of the Boulder community is vehemently opposed to the Muni waste of 10 years and loss of over $33 million. Muni supporters need to learn what the value of a highly regulated monopoly is versus an unregulated Boulder monopoly. Here's a real example of what the Boulder water utility monopoly has done to Boulder versus what the regulated Excel monopoly has done to my monthly bills. I compared my July 2014 and 2019 water and electric bills. I've had a solar lease since 2011 and include my monthly lease payments of $37. My water bill in 2014 for 5,000 gallons was $35. But in 2019, for 3,000 gallons, or 40% less water, was $63. My 2014 electric bill was $70, and in 2019 was $52. My Boulder unregulated water utility monopoly bill went up over 80%. And my XL regulated electric monopoly bill went down 25%. And this doesn't include Boulder's 2020 rate increases. Excel has increased renewables, shut down coal plants, and reduced carbon over 10 times Boulder's electric usage, while Boulder has been wasting time and money for 10 years. Muni supporters, look in the Muni mirror and see the failures and snap out of the denial. We need to end the Muni and let real carbon reduction begin now, not five years from now. We need to collaborate, not litigate. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. <clears throat> Next, we have Paul Coleman, A.K. Duvivier, and Riley Mancuso. Paul? Uh, good evening, Mayor Weaver and council members and staff. Uh, this disembodied voice belongs to Paul Coleman, and it's come to you from Shanahan Ridge on the southern edge of Boulder. Thank you for your kind and, in these times, courageous service to our community. In addition to COVID-19, I'm very concerned about global warming or climate change emergency. We must consider social justice while we switch to clean power to reduce fossil fuel usage. I believe that local control of our electricity is better for the climate and better for social justice in our community than having a regulated monopoly corporation control our electricity. One example is that Excel sells their wind source program at a premium, 
We all know today that wind power is cheaper than fossil fuel power, and yet Excel charges more for it. Another example is residential time of use rates that Excel is pushing through the PUC right now. Time of use rates charge more for electricity when demand is high on summer afternoons when a lot of us run our AC. The problem is that Excel has structured the new rates so that the owners of large homes that use a lot of electricity will see their bills go down and rate payers who use relatively small quantities of electricity like people in apartments and small condos will see their bills rise. This is the very definition of regressive. The rich will pay less and the poor will pay more. So council, please be stubborn about making any deal with Excel that would increase the bills of Boulder residents. If the city should happen to control its own power supply, we will not need to raise rates to get clean local power. And because the city would control the revenue stream, we could develop programs that would benefit small users rather than punish them. Local control of our electricity pays for itself. However, if we make a deal with Excel, they will control the revenue stream and we Boulder ratepayers will wind up paying for any special products and services from Excel with increased bills. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Next we have KK DeVivier, uh, Ryan Mancuso and Roy Arango. Uh, KK. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. Um, I'm a professor, a tenured professor oh, at the University of Denver and I specialize in energy policy and I'm now a resident of Boulder. Although I only became a resident a couple years ago I, and that means I don't have some of the, the history that other people do on the Muni issue and maybe some of the traumatic stress, I am aware of the legal maneuvers that Excel has used to waste Boulder's time and money and not move our climate goals forward. But outside of that history, I just want to say, as someone who studies in this area, I'm alarmed to hear that Boulder is even considering a 20-year franchise with Excel. And I also know there's some discussion about including a five-year opt-out, but that doesn't ass assuage my concerns. And let me say, here's why. One is that the human race has seen more social and technological change in the past two decades than in all the previous centuries combined. And these things are changing so fast that we barely have time to steady ourselves after one technological wave before another washes up on our deck. So now we don't have adoption curves, we have adoption rockets. So the way we have to, to overcome this is through agility. And Boulder, Boulder will be compromising its agility to move to other things if it gets tied to Excel. Uh, one of the main areas that things are changing is in solar. And there's no other power technology that's matched solar's pace for change. And finally, Many of you may have heard that Congress just came out with a solving climate crisis report um, just last month. And one of the recommendations in that report would be a clean energy standard to achieve net zero emissions by 2040, which is way ahead of Excel's uh, goals. So I just hope that Boulder will keep its options open and not get tied down to what's happened in the past because we can't go with the um, old systems anymore. Thank you, climate is too important. Thank you, KK. Um, Riley Mancuso, Roy Arango, and Ryan Selvin. Riley? Hi, um, my name is Riley Mancuso. I am a CU Boulder student and I serve on the Boulder Police Department's Community Dialogue and Engagement Panel. Um, and um, I would like to talk about um, some of the uh, disparities in enforcement uh, that um, uh, by police in Boulder. Um, so looking at the data for um, the month of April, which is the last month for which uh, data is available for police call logs, roughly 30% of calls were for trespassing and vandalism, which are minor broken windows offenses that both ate to abolition uh, and the more moderate reformist campaign zero uh, uh, campaign uh, call for, for the decriminalization of. Um, so we should really think about decriminalizing a lot of these arbitrary enforcements to reduce uh, 
the need for police and the taxpayer expense and the opportunity for discrimination. And speaking of discrimination, I would like to talk about how within the city of Boulder, um, people experiencing homelessness are hundreds of times more likely to be arrested for minor nonviolent broken windows offenses, including trespassing, public urination, smoking, uh, and camping. Um, the smoking ban um, in 2018 was used to target 223 people who were housed and 685 unhoused people had uh, faced, uh, faced court dates for violating the smoking ban. Um, this is given um, Boulder Police Department's own estimate in 2018 that the homeless population was a little under 2,000 people. Um, so we can see that the disparity in enforcement is, in, in, is incredible um, and we need to defund the police and stop them from hassling people for not having a place to sleep. Thank you, Riley. <clears throat> Last two uh, speakers tonight, Roy Arango and Ryan Selden. Roy? Hey, everyone. My name is Rui Arango. I'm a resident here in Boulder, as uh, most of you all probably know already. And tonight I am not here to tell you and talk to you about the incredible success of the No Eviction Without Representation or newer initiative in getting on the ballot in the midst of a goddamn pandemic, thanks to our brave volunteers. I'm in fact here to talk to you about something else. I'm here to talk to you about a petition. It's got a long title, so I'm gonna read it out. It is called the quote, help us create a safer Boulder, colon. Tell our city leaders they must take action now, petition. It has 1,149 signers. I imagine um, most of you on the council have seen this already. Um, make no mistake, this petition is nothing more than the hysterical wailings of the most privileged, privileged and comfortable Boulderites in our city. Their main demand for you, the council, is to fully enforce the urban camping ban, aka in the middle of a pandemic, have the police rough up, throw out, and destroy the belongings of our homeless neighbors. This is reprehensible. In a national moment in which we are acknowledging the horrendous violence that police perpetrate against the most vulnerable members of our society, this group of comfortable, wealthy Boulderites wants more police violence against poor and homeless people. It's awful. There's a whole list of allegations about in this petition about just what a war zone Boulder has become, most notable among them that organized crime has taken hold in our city. As if Tony Soprano is prancing around on Pearl Street with a switchblade threatening people. Council, this is ridiculous. I urge you to treat this petition with exactly the amount of uh, severity and uh, legitimacy that it deserves, which is to say none. Thank you. And defund the police too. Thank you, Roy. Um, last, Ryan Selden. Ryan? Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Ryan. Um, I'm a re Boulder resident, and I'd like to speak in support of the Bedroom Hour for People ballot measure. Uh, when I moved to Boulder with my girlfriend, the two of us rented the fourth bedroom in a four-bedroom house where each other room had one person. In this entirely reasonable configuration, we were unknowingly in violation of Boulder occupancy ordinances. Without knowing it, we're at risk of eviction for this violation. Having known and followed this limit would have made it much harder for us to find a living situation. This ordinance would have prevented me and my girlfriend from living here, even though we are skilled and ready to work, as well as shop, dine, and give back to the community here in Boulder that we love so much for its climbing, hiking, biking, restaurants, creek, and all the things that make Boulder so wonderful. We're now in compliance with the limits, but we have an empty bedroom we cannot rent. Uh, for this reason, I ask you to support the Bedroom Door for People ballot measure because my girlfriend and I haven't gotten married, we are legally blocked from opportunities that would be available to couples that happen to be married, which on its very face makes no sense. Uh, bedroom Door for People resolves the problem that would have kept us from receiving the housing we really need. I strongly urge you to put Bedroom Door for People on the ballot and to support in every way you can. Bedrooms Door for People is a critical step toward making Boulder accessible to a diverse group of people who deserve to share in all the amazing things that make Boulder great. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. So one more time, we will see if David Powell 
is out here. Any David Prowl? We see none in the meeting. So with that, we will close open comment and bring it back to council and turn to staff and see if uh, staff has any response. I'll start with the city manager. Thanks, Sam. I tried to turn my video on, but it didn't work just now. I'm sorry. Um, several of our speakers tonight had um, comments with regard to homeless issues. And I just want to remind council and the community that next Tuesday night, we will be having a study session on these issues with um, plenty of time and, and information for council to ask questions. So that should be a good meeting. Thanks. Great, thank you. Tom? I have nothing, Sam. Great, so I'll turn to council members. Rachel? Yeah, I just wondered, um, similar to the um, timing for homelessness updates, Jane, could you speak to, um, we ha had also a couple of speakers talk about defunding the police and policing concerns when we will um, bring that back to the public and um, updates maybe for timing for the um, oversight committee panel? Okay, so in a way you asked me a couple of questions. The issues about defunding the police um, relate to our budget and you will be having your major budget study session on September 8th. Uh, we're currently working on the budget right now and that um, will be released to council and the community at the end of August. And then you'll have a study session um, in early September, September 8th, um, where you can ask as many questions as you want. And you'll see our proposal for 2021, uh, which will include some changes to the police budget and some changes to all of the budgets that we have. Um, we do have a financial study session next week as well. Um, the oversight situation is um, proceeding in this way. Later this week, we hope to announce the um, acceptance by a um, new candidate or a candidate of the independent police monitor position. We're still working on the final uh, offer letter, but we're very sure that he will accept and be on board by the end of July. In addition, the task force that has been working on these issues is getting ready to have a study session with council on September 22nd. And at that time, they will be going over their recommendations for some changes to the ordinance the council passed last fall to make it clearer and to fill in some gaps that were intentionally left for them to be doing their work over this year. Um, and that ordinance is scheduled for first reading in October and second reading in November. So that work is well underway. Um, in addition, on October, um, August 4th, I'm sorry, um, Chief Harold will be here to talk to you about the commencement of the police master plan. And hopefully the council will be thinking about um, appointing a council process committee, similar to what you have done with some of the other work that we have around master plans. And also Chief Harold will be giving an update on the strategy that she talked to you about in June. So that's the timeline right now for the many things that are happening. Thank you. Great. Any other council members have comments, questions? Oh, uh, Mark. I, I think this question is for Kurt. Um, and if not, tell me who it should be directed to. One of the speakers, um, Mr. O'Connor, noted that there had been a reduction in beds uh, at our shelters of 69%. And so that leads me to a two-part question. Is, is that an accurate figure? And second, how many nights have we been at capacity in the last year? Because I think that goes to the issue of, of what expansion is required uh, in order to serve the unhoused community. Um, so I'll just give a brief answer to that. We'll be able to give a, a fuller answer um, next week. So um, Darren is correct that there has been a reduction in beds. Um, and um, however, normally we reduce severe weather shelter um, every year at the end of May, um, which we did this year. Um, the difference is that, is that navigation, which was 50 beds, um, 
uh, there was a handful of individ individuals in navigation that moved to the Boulder shelter. Um, we haven't been hitting um, the cap capacity. Um, I haven't looked at the data. I was on vacation last week, but um, we'll present that next week. I don't believe we've hit capacity though um, since the closure of 30th Streets. Um, and um, his question doesn't um, doesn't pick up the the full um, question that should be asked. Um, so while we are while we while we are reducing beds for shelter, we're significantly increasing beds for people to live in homes. Um, so if you look at it from that perspective, the number of beds has increased um, significantly. Um, but, but again, we'll, we'll be able to explain that uh, in a much more comprehensive way next week. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great. Rachel and then Adam. Um, while you're there, Kurt, I meant to um, also ask about the bathroom at Mapleton that's not open. And uh, I know we're getting into homelessness next week, but wondering uh, if there's an easy explanation for why that's not open, if we thought it was going to be. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer for that. Um, I'll, we'll have to check in with Allie Rhodes and get back with you on that. Um, because part of, that's a, a bathroom in, within the Parks Department. So. It's Parks. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Great. <clears throat> well, seeing no more hands, I would turn back to Debbie. Next this evening is your consent agenda and you have items A through C. Great. And so I think that is two sets of minutes and uh, a second reading about um, an IGA with uh, Boulder County. So does anyone have comments or a motion? I move the consent agenda. Second. Right. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? I do not see anything. Let me check hands here real quick. I don't see any hands. So uh, we have a motion and a second. Does anyone object to passing the consent agenda? Seeing none, the consent agenda passes eight to zero. Debbie? Um, next this evening, we have your call up, which is 3485 Stanford Court and its concept plan review. And this matter will be presented briefly by Shannon Moeller, I think. Yep, there you go, Shannon. Thank you. Shannon has some uh, remarks prepared this evening uh, regarding Stanford Court. I'd also note that we have some folks from EHP on the call tonight in case there's questions um, for the applicant this evening. So Shannon, you can take it away. And Sarah, are you able to put up that PowerPoint? Well, I don't have a PowerPoint for this item. You're with me? You're at 4A? Yes, I do. Okay, one moment. Okay, awesome. Um, so good evening, Council. Um, I was just asked to give a brief presentation <gasps> about um, this concept plan. Um, this concept plan, the Mount Cavalry Senior Housing Project was discussed at the mm -hmm. June 18th Planning Board hearing. And it's a proposal to develop 60 permanently affordable senior housing units at 3485 Stanford Court in the residential medium to zoning district. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
And because this is a concept plan review, there's no formal action being taken. Um, it's meant to be a dialogue between the city, the community, and the applicant. Next slide. Here you can see that the site, it's 4.9 acres and located in South Boulder at the terminus of Stanford Court, west of Broadway and north of Table Mesa. The proposal is required to undergo a concept plan review because it exceeds two acres or 20 dwelling units in this zoning district. And the existing site contains two church structures, two parking areas and community gardens. And the north portion of the site is heavily sloped and contains natural open space with social, tra social trails. Next slide, please. The original church sanctuary was built in 1957 and is proposed to remain. And an addition to the church constructed in 2001 is proposed to be removed and a new residential structure built in the southwest area of the site. The church congregation has relocated in 2019 and the Rainbow Child Care facility that currently operates on the site is proposed to remain. Next slide. The Boulder Valley Regional, Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan land use designation for this site is medium density residential. Um, it was recently updated in the 2015 BBCP update, and it's intended to provide a density of 6 to 14 units per acre. Next slide. And the site is zoned residential medium 2, which permits attached dwelling units at a density of up to 12.4 units per acre. Next slide. The proposal includes construction of a new three-story residential building in the southwestern area of the site to include 60 permanently affordable senior housing units. The addition to the church constructed in 2001 would be removed and the original sanctuary building would remain. The eastern parking area would remain with some improvements and a drive aisle and a small western parking area are also proposed in the southwest area of the site. The applicant received input from the surrounding community that um, it's important to maintain the sweep of the existing hillside and the character of the ridge. So this proposal does maintain to keep that hillside intact. And the north portion of the site is proposed to remain natural open space. Next slide. Here you can see the north and south building elevations and the existing sanctuary building is rendered in white. The proposal is a contemporary building with stacked flats on a double loaded corridor. It's cut into the grade appearing primarily as a three story structure at the west end of the site, or excuse me, at the east end and a two story structure at the east end. It's oriented parallel to the southern property line and there are two short wings that extend from either end. And there are several outdoor spaces provided including a large patio area and upper level terraces and small private outdoor um, ground level spaces for ground level units. And there's also a covered vehicle drop off plan at this other entry. Next slide. This slide list lists the overall city processes the proposal would be required to go through. Those include a site review amendment, a use review might be required for the daycare if the operating characteristics of the existing daycare were to change, um, a historic preservation review if landmarking was desired by the city or the applicant, and then vacation of right of way, technical documents, preliminary and final plats and building permits. Next slide. As part of the public process, notification was sent to property owners within 600 feet of the site. Staff received emails from about 10 folks and five individuals spoke at the planning board meeting. Most of the folks were opposed to the proposal and shared concerns about traffic and on-street parking, disturbance to the environment, wildlife and light pollution and a desire to continue community access and use of the site um, for potential uses like community gardens or a playground, and concerns about a lack of compatibility with the surrounding area. Staff also received a comment in support of the affordable senior housing and the daycare uses, and a suggestion to incorporate a neighborhood serving use such as a restaurant or coffee shop or a rentable community room. And the applicant also conducted several community outreach efforts prior to um, submitting this concept plan application, which they detailed in their written statement. And they also described those at the planning board meeting. Um, at the planning board, oh, excuse me, next slide. At the planning board hearing, the board discussed the proposal's consistency with the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan 
and the compatibility with the existing character of the surrounding area. The board found the proposal to be consistent with many BVCP policies, especially those related to permanently affordable housing, senior housing, enhanced design and repurposing of the existing sanctuary building. And the board supported the proposal's general compatibility with the surrounding character and discussed recommended changes to be made um, when the project moves forward to the site review um, application. Um, refinements were recommended to the height and the building massing um, to ensure public going through the site and integrating sump principles or a pool car into the plan. And overall, the board recommended eliminating the um, western parking area and the drive aisle to allow for more flexibility with open space in that area. And the board agreed that it would be comfortable with the parking reduction if one were to be proposed. Um, so that includes, concludes staff summary of this concept plan and I'm happy to answer any questions and the applicant Ian Swallow with BHP is here as well to answer any questions. Great. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Shannon. And I see no hands. Um, there's Mary um, and then Mark. Mary? Thank you, Shannon, for that presentation. Um, I ha have several questions. One is, this is the sanctuary building is the one that's going to um, become the COVID recovery center temporarily? Is that correct? My understanding is there is a use going on there. I don't know the, the details of that. Kurt? Yeah, um, th thank you, Mary. Um, again, I think I forgot to introduce myself, Kurt Fernhaber, Director of Housing and Human Services. Um, it's actually the, the facility that was built in 2001 that's um, currently being used for the COVID Recovery Center. Um, our intent is to use it um, through next spring. Um, we were looking for a facility that could um, could meet that time frame, and this facility is available during that time. Okay, but it is the at that location. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, and then my uh, um, another question is regarding. Um, I know that there's existing community gardens there. Um, what are the plans for that? Yeah, that was discussed at the planning board meeting. The um, initial drawings showed a small area of community gardens and it was discussed that that could be an area that the community would like to see enlarged and to kind of keep that um, neighborhood access to some type of amenity like that. Um, so that would be something that was recommended to kind of look at going forward when it goes to the site review stage. So the existing gardens would not stay it would become a smaller area in the same area yes so in the proposal documents um, the new proposed residential structure would be built generally in the area where the community gardens are now so if that would go forward as shown on those documents the community gardens would be, need to be relocated um, so that was something the board recommended to kind of look at and, and potentially um, change that proposal Okay, thank you. And then my final question has to do with the landmarking. And um, there was a little caveat there at the end of the presentation where it said, should that be desired? And what does that, should that be desired, hinge on? Yeah, so our landmarking folks would look at this um, proposal when it comes in for the site review. And if they determine that we think that that should move forward, um, they would make a recommendation through the site review process um, that they recommend that that application be made by the applicant. And if it were to go through the approval process, that would be a condition of approval. Okay, great. Thank you, Shannon. Great. Uh, Mark Wallach, Adams, Swetlick, and Mirabai Nagel. Mark? Okay, two questions. Thank you for that presentation. Mm -hmm. um, since we have the applicant here, I I'd like to know what is their view on landmarking the sanctuary? Would they be prepared to do that? Um, if requested. Absolutely. So, uh, good evening, Council. I'm Ian Swallow with Boulder Housing Partners. Uh, I am the project manager for this project. And yeah, as far as the landmarking goes, I think, you know, we would certainly be open to that conversation with the city. Um, I think the building certainly has some, some value to it. I think landmarking brings uh, a whole host of responsibilities that we'd want to be sure we really understood. But um, the intent right now is 100% to, to keep that building and preserve it. 
And my, my second question um, is based on a, a previous walkthrough I had on the site. Uh, th there's a portion of the property that, that's near um, a large apartment building across, I think it's across the street. And that portion of the site, and my directions may be off, I, is it the e maybe the eastern portion, um, receives very little of the massing of the residential um, portion of the project. And I was wondering why that is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think um, the adjacent apartments, the Boulder Creek apartments, they're right um, as you turn heading uh, west on Table Mesa from Broadway. They're kind of right there on that corner. So they abut, they're kind of east and I guess it would be south of the property. Um, and so as far as where the building mass got located, we actually um, did quite a bit of site planning work on, on where we landed. So um, the first part of that was a community design workshop that we had in February um, at the site. We presented three kind of concept plans of uh, potential building locations to the adjacent neighborhood, um, one of which was the single building, pretty similar to what you see in the concept plan, and then two that were broken up into two separate buildings. Um, we walked the attendees through that, and at the end, we had folks indicate preferences by putting little blue dots on which they preferred. Um, the result of that was really, I think, a strong preference for a single building um, in a single structure, you know, about where it's located now. Um, and the real, I think the real reason for that, and we heard in subsequent community events, was to keep that building as far back from the edge of that hillside as possible. And so when you put a, a structure on that east side of the site, what you end up having to do is push it a little bit north um, and it ends up sitting pretty, pretty high and pretty close above some of those single family homes. So uh, that's why you see the building structure where it is. It was really trying to keep it as far away from uh, single family neighbors on the west side, on the north side, um, and also accommodate um, the use on the site. So does that, does that answer your question? Yes, if that's the community preference, I'm fine. Thank you. Great, right, thank you, Mark. <clears throat> then we have Adam and Mirabai. Adam? Thanks, Sam. Um, I wanted to mirror Mary's statement about the community gardens on the west side. I know that's uh, pretty important, and I think that's something that we should try to maintain as best as possible when we're looking at the, the site plan. Um, I also had a question in regards to the traffic flow off Table Mesa. Um, are there any planned improvements to that intersection, given that there will be additional units in this area? And my, my most critical concern is that since this is a senior living area, um, ambulance access and emergency access may be, you know, used more often. So just making sure that we can actually accommodate that. Yeah, um, so in terms of the traffic for this project, um, this project was required to provide um, the traffic estimates for peak hour um, traffic generation, um, and those were low enough that it wouldn't be required to do a full traffic study, um, which would in turn trigger improvements potentially. So because the, the peak volume traffic counts are so low for this use type specifically, um, for the senior housing, um, that's what doesn't trigger some of those larger type of improvements. However, I have been told that separately that the city is looking at those intersections in the area and is looking at potential improvements to some of those intersections, but it, that the burden of doing those improvements wouldn't be placed on this project in particular is my understanding. Thank you. Bill, did you have a follow up to that? Yeah, I just wanted to confirm what Shannon just said. Bill Cowan with transportation, um, we've identified uh, the need for study and potential improvements at both the intersections of Table Mesa, Stanford, and Table Mesa and Broadway. And uh, they, they were identified in our Safe Streets Boulder report. Um, Table Mesa and Stanford was a study that we were going to do this year and was part of the um, COVID budget cuts. Gotcha. Yeah, uh, just having some reaffirmation that emergency services could reach that area that's something that I'm really interested in. Um, our, our studies were centered around um, crash 
elimination um, and it was not a, a congestion or efficiency concern. Okay. Okay. Um, good enough, Mirabai. Um, yeah, I just wanted to chime in on the community gardens and hope that we can find um, a spot for them to keep them at least the same size or even preferably grow them if, if it's needed, um, but not to lose them. Uh, I'm appreciate that we're not losing our open space either. And then um, I guess the one question I have, seeing as I know we don't have much say in this, but I think it's just very sad that every building we see come up just gets uglier and uglier than the one previous. And I mean, to me, this looks like a prison. It doesn't look remotely homey. It doesn't look welcoming. It looks cold and concrete. So I don't know if there's any influence or input that we can give to have it have a more welcoming feel, but it, I just think it's really sad that we have this gorgeous town and we're just building these box buildings that just don't have any character to them. So just my comment. Great, thank you. Um, so I see no more hands up and the question before us tonight is, do we want to call up the concept plan? Um, I know that uh, the applicant and staff will take into account everything that they've heard so far. Um, so I, I think our discussion pretty much needs to focus on a yes or no. We want to see this at a future date. Mary, you got your hand up? Yes, I do. And um, I don't have any desire to call it up, um, but I did want to just further comment on both the community gardens and the uh, landmarking. Um, one is um, on the community gardens, two things. Um, I think that kind of feature is really, really important because it um, it brings community together. If you've ever been to a community garden, um, people are working together and chatting and getting to know each other. And I think that it's a great way to um, bridge the two neighborhoods um, and, and create community. So um, I see it as a real important thing. Um, it's a long established community gardens and um, if um, anybody who's ever gardened knows that it takes many, many, many years to um, be able to create good soil in Colorado. So the, um, I believe that community garden is raised beds. Um, so if there's any way that, um, if it is moved and not kept as it is, to take that soil, um, save it, put it aside, and then put it in the new garden, I think that would um, give people um, a head start in a new community garden should it require a new one. And then uh, with respect to landmarking, um, I see it also as a valuable um, effort. Um, I know that it does um, provide the ability to um, obtain grants for its maintenance. Um, and so I encourage you to go through with the landmarking. So that's my comments. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Mary. Um, so a quick uh, poll is, does anyone want to call this concept plan out? Okay. Seeing no one um, who desires to call this up, I will call for any final comments on the concept plan. And seeing none, very good. I think we're done with this item. Thank you, Charles and Shannon. Okay, Debbie. All right, your first public hearing this evening is second reading in motion to adopt ordinance 8393, adding a new section 4-20-73 hemp licensing fee, adding a new chapter 4-33 hemp, adding chapter, amending chapter 5-10 marijuana offenses, adding a new chapter 5-11 cannabis offenses, amending chapter 6-14, medical marijuana, and 6-16, recreational marijuana. Senior counsel Kathy Haddock will be doing this presentation. Thank you. And Sarah, there is a PowerPoint for this. Just and um, Kathy, if you would like me to advance the slides, I can, or you can request control of the remote. Uh, but I'm happy to do which is easier, but I, not sure. I have not advanced the slides before, so I did. I you assume just ask me, and I'd be happy to move it forward for you. Thank you so much. Um, 
So th the first thing I want to do is emphasize the cross-departmental work that has happened on this issue. All the people listed on the agenda memo had um, real con contributions, have been involved in the issue for years as part of the marijuana enforcement team and were part of the drafting. Also, Michonne Cook and Rebecca Bostrak are on the line to answer any questions you may have after we go through this. I've started with the clarification of the state's definition that cannabis includes both hemp and marijuana. Cannabis refers to the plant and hemp and marijuana both refer to THC measurements within the plant. Um, the effect of the community is from the, the plant, not from the THC levels. So we, um, are looking at making a level pay playing field for marijuana cultivation and processing facilities and hemp processing and cultivation facilities only for the portion that has an impact on the community. We are not, the regulations do not include anything with respect to hemp retail sales and do not include the parts of marijuana for cultivation and processing that relate to security and some of the other things that are related because of the high THC. Anecdotally, there was an explosion at a house in Netherlands today. Um, when this happened in Boulder for what we believe was marijuana extraction, the homeowner claimed it was for hemp extraction and so avoided responsibility. This ordinance will help protect so that doesn't happen again and would deal with the explosion that happened in Netherlands today. The community has had input from the very beginning, first from um, that we got the odor complaints. They, because it was cannabis plants, it came to the marijuana enforcement team. However, they couldn't do anything because there were no regulations. And so it was difficult to help um, mitigate the concerns of the people. Um, we then started to figure out how many um, hemp cultivation and manufacturers there were in the city and found that there are more than there are marijuana businesses. And so we created a list of them and a draft ordinance was distributed to them directly and we, the chamber helped us distribute it to um, let those businesses have any input. We had two virtual public meetings for input and didn't have any uh, Boulder businesses participate. These, um, we've been working on this code for visions for longer than CLAB has been appointed. And CLAB just had the third meeting and feels like they're drinking from fire hose. So they have not looked at these yet, but when they get to the point of reviewing the marijuana codes, we'll also provide them these codes because that will be in their jurisdiction. So there may be some changes that come to you from CLAB. I think I've already said that the ordinance does not address hemp products that are sold um, it, and it's doing the level playing field on the ventilation and safety practices with extractions. Hopefully we won't have any more explosions. And um, the, this adds an additional a licensing program for those hemp businesses, for the cultivation facilities and the processing. I'm sorry, Sarah, I'm not telling you when to advance slides, but you're doing a great job. Um, the provisions of Title V that are changing are because we did have marijuana offenses in the code already, but most of those related to, some of them related to odors and some of them related to high THC levels used by minors and that kind of thing. So the changes to Title V that are in the ordinance are to separate the marijuana offenses that are related to THC levels over 0.3% and then put all cannabis offenses that apply to both, to either marijuana or hemp in a different section of Title V. We plan on doing licensing in two stages as a COVID-19 uh, accommodation. This plan originally would have required additional staff and that will not be happening. So we have proposed that the register that they start with a registration rather than licensing and that the businesses would register so that we know 
where the businesses are and what we have. And then they would have until July 1st of 2021 to complete the application requirement. Next slide. Um, and off, or Council Member Brockett pointed out a few errors that we had missed. Um, they're described in more detail in the agenda memo. I just want to point out that they've been corrected in the ordinance that's in your packet for tonight. Council Member Brockett also had two policy amendments that he's proposed and we're prepared to answer any questions you may have about those. And we're ready for Council questions. Thank you, Kathy, for that. <clears throat> Apologies for being a little slow. Um, I do not have any hands at the moment. Um, okay, Mark just showed up. Mark? Mark, we can't hear you. Thank you. Um, some of the language in the proposed statute was a little confusing to me because it, it talks about licensing on the basis of the completeness of the application, um, but doesn't seem to grant um, the licensing entity with sort of a police power to deny an application that is complete but unsatisfactory in terms of what is you know of, of what they're proposing, in terms of odor control and the like. Um, am, am I missing a provision of the statute that, um, I that does that? Yes, I believe if I can get to my right place in your council packet numbers, that the um, requirements for the license and, and um, approval or denial are in sections about three, it, it, so it's four dash 33 dash three related to that the license is required. So the license has to be issued for operations. Of course, that does not apply to any existing businesses that have a sales tax license from the city. That would just apply to new businesses coming into the city. And then 4-33-4 um, has general provisions, which include the general licensing uh, granting provisions. And this is on packet, the page 55 of your packet um, and then it goes on to what the application has to have in it okay and my other question um, is that there's a uh, you, you can't have a hemp operation operating within 500 feet of three other businesses is that correct that's correct uh, how close can they get to another business if there are only two it, we only measure the radius from each individual business of 500 feet around. So we don't measure how close they are to each other. So two could be right next to each other um, and that wouldn't be a violation. And also I wanna point out what, cause good question, this requirement also does not apply to any existing businesses. We're not intending to shut down any existing businesses. But if odors are, if odors are an issue, um, Shouldn't we be a little firmer in our uh, ability to control proximity? Well, that's a policy question for you. I mean, this is um, what was carried over from marijuana. Mm -hmm. um, it would be easier to determine where the odor is coming from if, well, definitely if there's not a lot in the same area. If there's two right together versus two apart, It'd be easier to tell, but there's also limited areas of industrial zoning in the city, and that requirement has not been established before. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Great. And then Mary and Bob. Mary? Thank you, Kathy. Um, so my question, my first question is about the um, energy offset fund. Will hemp businesses be required to uh, pay into the energy offset fund? They, it's no, it's not in this ordinance. The reason is, although it's the same and it's related to the plant, the reason why we can impose it on the marijuana businesses as isolating a specific business is because they're heavy, heavily regulated industry and we didn't have that same issue here. 
So we didn't feel comfortable that we had the authority to impose those on criteria of the type of business it was. If this council were to decide to impose that requirement more broadly based on emissions or something, we could impose it on all the businesses that met that level. But they do use um, energy at the same intensity as marijuana. Yeah, they do. They grow the plants. I, I shouldn't say city. exactly the same because I'm not an expert, but it's pretty close to exactly the same. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then um, my next question is about um, one of, um, of Aaron's um, suggestions, an additional 30 days for license request, uh, renew, um, basically gives them an additional 30 days grace period. Um, I think the memo said that in that window, that 30 day window, um, they would be basically operating without a license. Um, is that the case? Yes, we'd have to figure out what to do because we're kind of creating a, a limbo period. So they're either operating without a license or we basically say that the term of a license is 13 months rather than 12. So, um, okay, well, I'll, I'll deal with that in the comments. And, um, and then my next question, um, in the um, ordinance, um, there's different fines for um, cultivation and extraction based on whether or not they're major or minor cultivation or extraction businesses. And I was just wondering how are those um, delineated and what's the threshold between to be one versus the other? Okay, and if I'm correct, I think you're referring to the fees that are on um, the first page of the ordinance. Uh, uh, it, it is um, for uh, section 4-20-73. Correct, and those are the fees that are charged for the license application rather than fines that may be imposed for violation. Oh, okay, okay. The, the fines are separate. Um, you know, that's not something that is in here specifically, but our intent is that the um, map spent a lot of time determining what is the difference between a minor modification of a business facility and a major modification. And these are the types of modifications that occur after the business has a license and it wants to expand or it wants to add, you know, a new big piece of equipment or whatever. And MAP came up with a delineation of what's minor and what's major, and that was made into a city manager rule. And our intent is to apply the same rules for these. So it's contained within a city manager rule? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then, um, and this may have been one of the corrections, I'm not entirely sure. Um, the current ordinance sunsets on August 7th, 2021, and so that, that's why we have to adopt this on emergency. So I'm just curious as to why it requires a whole, there's a year's gap and we have to do this on emergency. And so that confused me a little bit. Um, this is on page, uh, packet page 82. Whoops, I just switched over to my non-packet version. Um, and maybe that's an error because this is not intended to be an emergency ordinance. And you're right, the staff recommendation does. Oh, I'm sorry, 82 is, looks to me like it's the dockless spike ordinance. Oh, did I jump over to the other one? Okay, yep. sorry. That's the next <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. I, I, I confused my question, sorry about that. Um, and then, um, it's getting dark in here and I don't have enough light. Um, oh, 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 what is my, um, so um, in your presentation, you mentioned that part of the work that lies ahead is to map out where all of the existing businesses are. Is that, did Correct. I hear that correctly? So. That means that we don't know right now if um, there is or there isn't a business that is already, or businesses, I guess, that are already 
um, co-locate it within a 500 uh, foot radius of an existing marijuana business, right? That's correct. Okay, so if if um, if we didn't go through with this um, six businesses within the 500 foot radius as proposed by Aaron, then um, we'd have to figure out what to do with those businesses that are already within the 500 foot. Well, this is written that it doesn't close any business that's existing on, um, I forget what the date is in here, I think it's July 1st of 2020, if they have a sales tax license from the city, that okay. they wouldn't be closed because of the provisions in here. Okay. So, you know, even if we end up that we have 10 within 500 feet, this ordinance wouldn't close down any of them. Okay, so it would be kind of a grandfathering. Exactly. Uh, okay, great. And then, um, oh, 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 oh. So the reason we're doing this is because of state law and, um, and what we really have to address is the, um, the safety and the odor, odor issues with hemp. Is that? Yes, that's what we have to address. State law um, is very confusing on this issue because it's regulated both by the Colorado Department of Agriculture and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. And right now they and Ned in the Colorado Department of Revenue are trying to reconcile how they make all this work and struggling with that. And our team um, is participating in those committees. Okay, great, thank you. And then my final question is, um, did the Cannabis um, Advisory Board um, have a look at this ordinance? They have not. This was um, done be well before they were appointed and they just had their third meeting and feel like they're drinking from a fire hose. So our plan is when we do, when they look at the code revisions for marijuana, I'm sorry, I should back up. They're looking for education at this point and adding more meetings for education. But when they do look at the code provisions for marijuana, they'll be looking at these two and maybe bringing some changes to you. So if I understand what you're saying is that we would go ahead and pass this ordinance, then they would have a look at the ordinance as we pass it today and then recommend changes to it. Um, yep. is that, is that what you're thinking? Yes. And, and their changes would be either that marijuana and hemp should be treated differently in a way that we treated them the same in the ordinance or that both the marijuana and this ordinance should be changed. Okay. Now, would it be another option to, um, separate out just the safety and order, um, issues? and issues and then deal with the sep the land use issues um, and um, any other issue separately? Is that another possibility? That is an issue, but as you know from Matt, I mean, that is a possibility. Um, although if you don't adopt anything now, then marijuana and hemp are not on a level playing field because marijuana does have the limitation. And you may recall that MAP has been asking you for a couple of years to put the Title IX considerations, the land use considerations for the marijuana code on the work plan for planning. And it hasn't risen to that level of priority for council. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, and changing the, or having different land use requirements would fall into that same category. Okay. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Um, Bob? Uh, thanks. Um, I have three questions. All, all of them relate to attachment B, and I think Sarah can put that up on the screen. Two of them are drafting questions, and one of them is a process question. So this is these are the two uh, policy um, changes that Aaron had suggested, and would, by the way, I, I do support. But I do have two questions relating to the draft. If you can scroll down, the drafting on the second one relating to renewal of license. This is that grace period that Mary was just referring to. Um, the third sentence doesn't make sense to me the way it's written. It says, if the applicant fails to apply for renewal at least 30 days after the expiration of the license, but does apply for renewal prior to 30 days after the expiration of the license, then it goes on to say that, that they can submit a late application. I think there's a drafting error there. I think you're right. We have a, a 
duplicate clause in here that needs to come out or duplicate information. Yeah, maybe if you, you could probably just take out um, the, but. The, the first 30 days. If the applicant fails to apply for a renewal before the expiration, but does apply for renewal prior to 30 days after. Oh, well, that's true. You're right. That'd be another. Yeah. That'd be another way to do it, and that's probably better. Okay, so if you could, we could fix that if if okay. there's support for attachment B. The second question I have is also on attachment B. It's a drafting. Continuing on that sentence, it says the city may process the renewal application. Are, are is that an intentional may? Are we are we leaving it to the city's discretion whether to um, allow people a grace period, maybe we will, maybe we won't, or, or are we going to give everyone a grace period as long as they pay the $1,500 uh, fine? Um, it's not an intentional may to give um, discretion to the staff. Um, it's the same language that was in, um, that is in the marijuana code, and we interpret it as a shall, we can write it as a shall if you'd prefer. Okay, that, that just maybe would give applicants a little comfort to know that they can submit an application late if they pay the fine. And then the, my final question is not a drafting question, it's really just a, a process one. Um, will the applicant, if the applicant misses, is just in a, in a, uh, inattentive and misses their, uh, their expiration date, will the city send a notice out to them saying, hey, you missed your expiration date, you got 30 days to get good with us? Or do they have to kind of like wake up within that 30 days on their own? The, the process is, well, it's a combination of answers. Um, the, the city automatically sends notice to each business owner 90 days before their license expires, gives them the warning, and then uh, that they have to apply within the next 45 days because they have to apply 45 days before expiration. I'll let Michonne answer what as a practical matter happens after that. Um, good evening, Council. This is Michonne Cook, Licensing Manager. So the way that we handle both liquor licensing and marijuana licensing um, and many other types of licensing that we do is we uh, send renewal documents out um, to the licensee at their business mailing address or we're doing it via email uh, right now. but. Uh, we send that information out 90 days prior. We let them know on those documents what their 45-day deadline for filing is, and we remind them also um, when their license expiration date is. Um, depending on how many licenses um, we have, and we have about 750 licenses right now that we're currently in charge of, um, uh, we may may not be able to send reminders um, over and above that 90 day um, renewal documents. So. Okay, thanks Michelle. Yeah. That's all I had. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the same topic. Um, could somebody explain to me, I'm not entirely understanding if you are if staff is sending out 90 day notices prior to the expiration of a license, what the purpose of an extra 30 days would be. Um, and if the way around um, that 30 day grace period when they would be without operating without a license required the, the workaround would be to provide licenses for 13 months, that just seems like wildly inconsistent with everything else that the city does. So I, what is the purpose behind that 30 day grace period? You know, that's something that council member Brockett would have to answer. Um, I think he was looking for additional time. Your question is exactly the same as previous councils have and why none of our licenses do have a grace period. One of the things that council member Brockett um, stated that he was concerned about is there has been a business that let his license expire and then um, his attorney wrote letters to counsel saying that it was because of this provision that he lost his license but the truth is that the um, applicant hadn't paid sales taxes for almost a year and didn't want to pay them which is why his license expired so Mary, I, I spoke with Aaron about this a little bit. 
And because we're grandfathering businesses, there's a significant consequence if your license lapses. So if you're a business with you're, you're within 500 feet of say four businesses or violate one of our other provisions, but you're grandfathered in, if your license lapses, then you lose your business. Um, you can't just reapply because we won't accept a new application. So Aaron was wanted to give them a little bit more time. Even with a 90 day warning, some people make mistakes and he just wanted to give some people a break. That's, that, that's the reason for his proposal. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Any more questions from council? Seeing none, I think we want to turn to the public hearing now. Let's see. Okay, I'm ready for you, Sam. Yeah, hang on just one moment. I am I had it and then now it's disappeared. Give me just a moment here. Having computer issues, I believe the first person up was Lynn Siegel, is that correct? That's correct. So we have two speakers signed up on this topic, Lynn Siegel and then Andrea Minigal. Great, why don't you go ahead, uh, Lynn? You will have three minutes when you're ready. Let me cue up the clock. Yep. Okay, you're Lynn, Lynn, you're on live. Speaking of rules and what Mary was just speaking about, this is Lynn Siegel, is um, the 13 months or the 90 days, whatever. Uh, if they're in these businesses, they can learn to follow the rules, you know? And the city's in a downturn now, they could use the money if people wanna just lax off on their licenses for this stuff. It's not necessary in our society anyway. And I mean marijuana, not hemp. So I support anything you want with hemp, but not so much with marijuana. What I really think we need to do is get rid of alcohol. Does it help with the virus at all? Because people get all touchy feely and breathe all over each other when they're drinking alcohol and trying to um, socialize. Um, so I'm opposed to any alcohol now during this virus in particular, but it's a downturn of whole culture anyway, but that's just me. I'm a prohibitionist from way back. Um, but anything that would um, um, support hemp for oil and for all the functional things that it serves in our society, marijuana does not, alcohol does not. So I support marijuana much more than alcohol because I think it's a much friendlier drug to the community. Um, and, and alcohol is so destructive for you know, other, a lot of other things, social systems and car accidents and everything else. But um, anything that you could do in this bill that would support um, hemp over marijuana. <laughs> and, um, and I'm sorry that I can't speak to what I wanted to tonight, um, because of all of your rules, you know, that way too many rules, um, five o'clock by this time on this day and two o'clock by that time on that day for signing up and different on all the boards and commissions. So I didn't sign up for the parking thing tonight, but that's your loss. You're not gonna hear what your public has to say and it's your own fault. So clean up your act. I sent you I don't know how many letters about cleaning up the website for the city, which is not navigable, which is not user friendly, which does not engage and invite the public. This is not a, a city that should be engaging in this kind of behavior in drawing in its citizens as a resource in an educated community where you can get a lot of benefit from, from your folks that are out there. I'm sure there's so many that are not tuning in because they just don't want to go through the bureaucracy. So 
just saying, you're missing out on me on the parking tonight, but that's your choice as far as I'm concerned. Done. Thank you, Lynn. Andrea? Andrea? Can you hear me? Yep. All right. Uh, this is Andrea Menegel on behalf of the Boulder Chamber, 2440 Pearl Street. And um, I'd like to start by thanking staff, particularly Michonne, Kathy, uh, Officer Bostrack, for the outreach opportunities that were provided to the businesses. While we helped get the word out broadly, COVID-19 impacted the capacities for some to be engaged. Um, recognizing that the primary objective of this ordinance is to regulate for safety and odor mitigation measures, there's good reason to address those cultivation issues now. And what's being presented seems to be consistent with the cannabis industry regulations. As far as the additional aspects like what Council Member Brockett pointed out on the hotline, there are areas where we should differentiate the regulations between those in hemp and cannabis businesses. For instance, we support the point he raised about how new licensees can geographically impact previously established businesses. But it sounds like, you know, we're, we're trying to work through that. Um, for other regulations that attempt to align with the city's cannabis code, a lot of work has been dedicated over the years to create that code. And it wasn't perfect right away, but it continued to evolve. And for which reason, as a community, we just seated a cannabis licensing advisory board. Some of those members are steeped in the evolution and the complexities of our cannabis code and provide the expertise about not only where hemp could align with cannabis regulations, but also where the hemp industry is unlike those in cannabis and we would wanna differentiate policies accordingly. So, you know, we realize the challenges about the timing of all this, aligning our regulations with changes at the state level, the recent seating of the cannabis board, trying to conduct outreach during COVID closures. But we've spoken with staff and we commend their willingness to allow the cannabis advisory board to review the regulations, um, to continue to engage businesses and community members and to continually refine these regulations so we can get something that, that everybody is um, supportive of. We hope you can support that and an approach to deal with the pressing issues now and allowing the citizen board to provide recommendations for, for the rest and everything else that's out there. So thank you for your time and um, thank you for serving the community. Great, thank you Andrea. And with that, we will bring <clears throat> public comment to a close and return to council. Um, so now's a good time to have discussion. I have a comment, but I would be happy to defer to anyone who wants to raise their hand. Great, so I will just kick us off. I think this is a great um, first uh, start <clears throat> at regulating hemp, particularly the public uh, facing impacts of hemp or the external impacts from the production process. Um, I, I'm gonna disagree with Aaron's suggestion a little bit, but only because we're grandfathering. So his suggestion about having three hemp businesses plus three marijuana businesses within a 500 foot radius is essentially doubling the concentration of odor production if we do that. I certainly agree with staff's proposal not to put any businesses um, out of business through a, a um, concentration regulation. So I definitely don't want a concentration regulation to result in anyone having to shut down. But going forward, as far as perspective and how we want to regulate um, the two industries, hemp and, and marijuana, I think one thing we want to be sensitive to is the impacts on, on the community as far as odor goes. So for that reason, I won't necessarily support what Aaron was uh, trying to do as far as not, <clears throat> as far as allowing three hemp plus three marijuana in a 500 foot radius. But I do think if that 500 foot radius is not the right number, you know, if it's too big or too small for the purpose of controlling um, odor, I think we should look to our um, newly seated advisory board to let us know that. So, uh, 
on on balance, I think this is a good um, start at these regulations. I think putting hemp and marijuana to the extent that they have public impacts on the same footing is is the right thing to do here. So I'll support all of this. I don't think I will support um, the proposal that Aaron brought forward as far as the radius goes. And then I guess I do have uh, a little thought around his second point, which is the grace period. I, I would almost prefer to solve that problem with multiple notices, one at 90, and say one at 30, say, hey, you know, you missed it. Because I kind of agree with a comment that Mary made earlier, which is it seems kind of crazy to either do 13 months or do a grace period. I think, you know, if, if we're concerned that somebody losing their license would mean that they lose their business, I think we just need to make sure that we're giving them enough notice ahead of time. So with that, I'm done. Um, next, we have Mary and Bob. Thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, I agree with everything that Sam has said. And um, since we are putting that kind of grandfathering process in there, I, I feel okay about um, um, not proceeding with um, Aaron's amendments. I I really appreciate the effort that he was putting into trying the problem he was trying to solve, but I don't think that we have that problem. I think that we're going to learn a lot when all the businesses get mapped and um, and we see how close businesses are to each other. And so I think that'll be an important piece. Um, and then on the um, 30 day grace period, the two options of either um, allowing a business to operate without a license just doesn't make any sense to me. And then issuing 13 month licenses kind of keeps moving the date down the road each time that you issue another 13 month license. It just, it doesn't make any sense and it could be really confusing. So um, I would prefer to go the route that Sam um, suggested or to send um, a notice at 135 days, when at 90 days, when at 45 days. Um, and, you know, businesses will just have to be grown up about it and, and be aware that their, their um, license is expiring. So um, the other thing is that um, I do understand that trying to separate out the, the safety and order portions of this ordinance would be really difficult um, and just the way it's written right now. So um, my suggestion would be that um, we pass it and then kick it over to the collab as soon as possible because um, they'll do the deep dive and take a look at all of these questions in a very um, um, well thought out manner that um, council just can't do tonight. So I would like to, um, as soon as this passes, to send it over to the CLAB ASAP and have them um, come back with some recommendations for changes. And, um, and the other thing um, too is the energy offset fund. I do think that um, that should be one of the things that they look at um, so that they are energy intensive, just as energy intensive as marijuana. So why not? Um, that's what I would like to understand. So um, that's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mary. <clears throat> Bob, you're up next. Well, I'm, I'm going to disagree with Sam and, and Mary a little bit on, on Aaron's uh, changes, which I actually think are good, and I'll take them one at a time. Um, as I understand it, the, um, the principal um, objective for the 500-foot radius back when marijuana was um, being licensed was less about odor um, and more about a fear that, um, that too many marijuana companies will come into a concentrated area and take up a bunch of warehouse space and because marijuana is a lucrative business that they would be able to outbid 
um, other uses of a warehouse space. I don't think we've actually seen that. And actually now in the age of COVID, I think uh, landlords would be happy to get tenants. So um, I don't think that's a problem or it's not the problem that people thought it would be. Um, I think actually just the opposite. I think with respect to odor, we want to encourage these types of businesses, whether they're hemp or marijuana, to be concentrated and closer together because the more they're spread out around town, the more um, residents and other businesses are going to impact. I think we want to encourage concentration of, of hemp and, and marijuana businesses in warehouse districts near each other. Um, I understand that our staff has pretty sophisticated equipment that can detect if there's an odor problem where it's coming out of building A or building B that's a few hundred feet away. So I, I think this is actually an odor um, concentration and prevention uh, a mechanism, and I don't think we have the problem that we thought we were going to have when we were using the 500 foot radius. Um, so I actually support Aaron's um, 500 foot um, s separate 500 foot radius measurement for new businesses uh, in the camp industry. With respect to the second, I, I partially agree with Sam and Mary. I do. Th I would like at least in the first year or two, staff to send out. Um, uh, uh, reminder notices or follow-up notices, either at or or um, or or before the expiration, the second notice, um, because as Tom said, you know the the penalty for for missing your deadline is pretty extreme. I mean, if you've signed a long-term lease with your landlord and you've hired a bunch of employees and you've made substantial investments in your business and you miss you blow a date and and, and we've all missed deadlines before you're in a very bad situation. You have to lay off all your employees. You may be, have personally guaranteed your lease. Um, you've made investments in equipment and so on and so forth. And so I, I would, would like to encourage staff, at least in the first couple of years until people kind of get in the groove. I, I realize Michonne has to manage 700 licenses between liquor and other things, but um, it sounds like there's about 50 of these. I would encourage staff to send out a, a second notice. But I, 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 um, I do think it's a draconian uh, effect to have the have the the, um, the business put out of business and, and and possibly lose their entire business because of the of the uh, location, the distance requirements, um, because they missed a deadline. Um, I, I do think we should give them an opt. There's all sorts of instances um, where people who miss deadlines, whether you forget to renew your driver's license, your car registration, or other deadlines, you can come in. You can say mea culpa. You pay a little bit of a fine, and you get and you get good. And I think telling people, hey, listen, if you blow your expiration date, you're out of business. And if you happen to be within uh, 500 feet of, of uh, three other businesses, you are literally out of business. You, you have to shut down, you lose your lease, you have to lay off your employees. That seems to me awful dramatic. A $1,500 fine is a pretty steep penalty for missing the date, but I, th I think we should give people a 30 day grace. I don't think it has to be a 13 month. If I were to do it, I'd just say you're out of compliance, you're out of license. Um, there, there are people who, 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 whose cars aren't registered or who's missed the driver's license renewal by a few days. It's not the end of the world. Um, they'll have 30 days to cure. If they miss it a second time after Michon sends them a second notice, um, yeah, then, then, then maybe they're big boys and big girls and um, they, they have to um, suffer the consequences. But I, I would not be that severe about about that. So I actually do support Aaron's attachment B and the two changes that he suggests. Okay, I see no other hands up. So <clears throat> if there's a desire for more discussion, now's the time to speak. If not, uh, I would invite a motion. Can I, can I suggest this, Sam, since, since it sounds like we have differences of opinion, can I make a motion that would include attachment B See if there's five votes in support of that. If not, then somebody can make a second motion without attachment B. Does that make sense? Yeah, it works for me, I assume for everyone else. I'm sorry, does somebody have an ordinance number? I don't have this on my screen. Or motion language. Yeah, it's uh, ordinance number 8393. I move that we adopt um, ordinance 839, is 8393, Tom? 8393. 8393, um, with um, attachment, with the modifications, the amendments proposed in attachment B, as further amended um, by the discussion that I had with Kathy, I'm making those two language changes. Okay, is there a second for Bob's motion? I will second. Okay, you got it, Rachel. 
Okay, so we have motion and a second. So all in favor of Bob's motion, raise your hand. One, two, I count three. Okay, uh, Junie, did you vote on that? Are you all opposed to Bob's motion? Raise your hand. Two, three, four, five. Okay, so it fails <clears throat> five to three. Um, Mary? So um, I move that we adopt ordinance 8393, adding a new section 44-20-73 hemp licensing fee adding a new chapter 4-33, the suggested motion language on packet page 40, um, 48, um, as presented in our memo. With the, with, um, without the, the amendments as proposed by, by Aaron Brockett. So I will second, but I will also offer a friendly amendment. Um, to the motion, which is that we include the um, drafting suggestions that Bob had had put out there. Those, only, those only apply to attachment B, which we're not, sounds like we're not moving. Oh, I see. Right. Okay, right. good point, yeah. good point. <laughs> okay, uh, Adam. Yeah, I was just thinking, um, I think Bob has a pretty good point, but the 30 days seems very lenient to me. Is there maybe, a seven day grace period we could go for or like you know 30 days really is like dragging your feet if you're out of license then it seems like you're not caring if you get a full 30 days um just throwing that out there before we vote um so adam would you so the suggestion that i made was to provide another reminder um, 135 days prior to the expiration. So that's an additional 45 days ahead of the expiration. So they would get one at 135, one at 90, which is usually what happens, and then one at 45. So you get it at the front end rather than after your um, license has expired. Um, sure. So. Yeah, so long as staff is reasonably certain they can accomplish that, I think we can move forward with three reminders. Um, I think that's pretty fair. Okay, um, just a colloquy on that. Uh, I see Rachel's hand up, so I'll call on you in a moment, Rachel. I just wanted to ask staff, um, probably Michonne, could you respond to Adam's point? Is it something that you could do for hemp businesses, at least in the first couple of years, to send them multiple reminders about their license expiration? Well. My comment is the way that I would like to accomplish this is have it be consistent and uniform. Um, and um, I believe that what we can accomplish is it's part of our standard reporting in our database system that we send out renewals 90 days prior. We have procedures for that, we have reports, it's automatic. I think that what we could accomplish is sending um, an additional reminder, sort of like a blanket report, you know, you're 90 days out from your license expiration date to the extent that you haven't renewed with the city yet, you should do so now, you know, or something like that. We, we may want to do it though, maybe we send out something 90 days prior and then we send out something 60 days prior because they still have two weeks to be timely, you know, before their 45 day um, deadline. I think we could do two notices. I think it would be difficult. We, we do things in batches. We do things in churns, usually 25 at a time, and it's an automated process. I think we, um, I think city licensing could write reporting in our database system to do one at 90 and 60, but I probably would want to do a similar thing also um, for marijuana businesses as well, just to have it be um, consistent, so. Okay, very good. Uh, Adam, do you have any follow-up or questions? No, the, so to me that sounded like, did I hear two or three? Just want to clarify. Two. two. Okay. I think we can do two uh, from gotcha. a resource perspective. Okay, that, that leaves me at a weird balancing point, honestly, um, but I'd love to hear others. 
Um, Mishana, I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. So sending out two notices, one at 90 and one at 60, and sending them out to everybody, um, that is one more notice than what you do now. It, it is because um, right now we do 90 uniformly. And then when we issue licenses, we have lots of dialogues with liquor and marijuana. You know, your 60 days out from your license expiration date is a magic number. Put it in your phone, write it on your calendar, all of those types of things, because you need to file 45 days prior. Um, essentially what I'm proposing is we would do our standard at 90, they'd get all their renewal documents, it would have their 45 day pre-file and also their license expiration date, but then we could send one at 60, you know, your 45 day pre-file is two weeks from now. To the extent that you haven't filed a renewal, you have to do it now. Um, you know, and I, and I think I think that that's a good balance and it would also help um, marijuana licensees as well because they have similar um, requirements as far as deadlines and timing. So. so the consequences for a marijuana business missing their renewal opportunity um, is the same. They lose their yes, business. Yes, very, very similar. So, so fix, um, have a more global solution is what I'm proposing. So really, um, by doing it um, at, at 90 days and 60 days, you're actually um, making it better for everybody, marijuana businesses and for hemp businesses. It, it, and I also am uh, still giving them a, 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 a better chance to be timely to still hit their 45 day pre-file. So, yeah. Thank Great. you. And just to follow up on that <clears throat> question, if, if a business were to miss their filing deadline, they would not necessarily be put out of business unless they were in a, a highly concentrated area under the current rules. Is that right? Well, we will, um, so I'll use marijuana as the example, which is what we have right now. I mean, if, if a marijuana licensee were to file after their 45 day pre-file, we would take the renewal they would have to pay a late filing fee, but so long as they did all of the things that they needed to do in order to qualify for the city renewal by their license expiration date, they would still be renewed. If instead they show up, you know, a week after their license expiration date and say, I want to file my renewal now, my answer would be, you have to file a new license application and under a new license application, we would do zoning analysis anew because it's a brand new license application. And, um, you, and, and then the zoning density would be denied um, by virtue of that. So. Right, but that's only if they're in a highly concentrated area, correct? Yes, if there if they're are more than three already and they're the fourth, but they were operating under grandfathering originally. So. Great, so the risk is greatest to those who are grandfathered then. Yeah. Rachel? Yeah, Adam's question just made me wonder if maybe some people supported one of Aaron's um, requests or suggestions and not the other. So did we wanna do like a straw poll to see if maybe there was a majority for either the 500 or the 30 days? We can do that. <clears throat> um, so I guess just doing a straw poll. Uh, who supports having Aaron's suggestion of three hemp businesses and three marijuana businesses within a 500 foot radius? Okay, I count three. Okay, and then we can, okay, Junie, that's four. <clears throat> um, sadly, that's still not enough for that one. Then if we move to the second one, um, it is a 30 day grace period after the expiration of the license um, for him. So who would support a 30 day grace period? So I see two people supporting that. So I don't think there's appetite for either one. What I will say is if we pass it the way it is, I would hope that as Mary suggested that the Cannabis Advisory Board would take it up. And if this is going to be a problem, there's a year 
for them maybe more than a year actually um, before we start licensing. There's a lot of runway between here and there um, before anybody could even potentially lose their business. So if we pass it the way it is and the advisory board takes it up and comes back to council with advice on this subject, I agree with Mary, they'll have had a lot more time to dig in and think about all the implications. So hopefully we could make a change for their advice if there's any problems that we're passing tonight. Um, so to that end, Sam, would it make sense to make an additional motion that says um, to have the, the CLAB um, Cannabis Licensing Advisory Board take a look at this um, right away? I probably personally wouldn't say right away. I'd say, you know, um, with all due speed, I, I just don't, you know, from the way Kathy described it, they're coming up to speed right now and ramping up. So I, I don't know how we'd say it, but I think, I think we can at least direct Kathy to have this as one of the first items staff suggests that they take a look at. Yeah. I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you that um, I think they're feeling a little overwhelmed now and already adding more meetings um, than their once a month meeting. So um, we definitely will have it high on the list. Got it. And, and Kathy, can you remind me, you had a slide up, <clears throat> but you talked about um, when we would be starting implementation of this. So when would we first start licensing, accepting applications for hemp business licensing? The licensing itself would be July 1st of 2021. Before that, we'll just be doing registrations and then can map to see whether we have a problem with a bunch within one area. So then the first potential <clears throat> um, license expiration will be in summer of 2022, is that correct? Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems to me like we have two years more or less for um, the board to get to this and give us advice. So, okay, yeah. Mary, Mary made a motion. Uh, Rachel, do you have another comment? I'm sorry. No, okay, your hand's still up. That's the only reason I asked. So we have a motion and a second. The motion is to pass the um, staff recommended uh, measures for hemp licensing. So all in favor of the motion, uh, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that passes unanimously. Um, so I would like to make an additional motion okay. um, that um, city council requests that the cannabis licensing advisory board um, analyze this ordinance as passed tonight um, prior to um, the summer of 2022, um, such that their recommendations could be implemented prior to then. Second. Okay. Okay. Any discussion on that motion? I'd just like to offer maybe a friendly amendment. Um, Mary, I think I thought you made a really good point about um, um, considering the energy surcharge um, as well, and, and um, I don't know if we have to make that as part of the motion, but I'd like to suggest that we have CLAB um, and staff come back um, and suggest whether the energy surcharge should apply to the businesses as well. Um, friendly amendment accepted. Okay, so I think this one will have good <clears throat> support. Is there anyone who objects to Mary's motion? Seeing no one, that also passes unanimously. So I think unless anyone has any further comments, we're done with this. I want to thank staff for your hard work pulling this together. I think it's important that we put these, these two industries kind of on the same playing field. I think everyone did a nice job at making some important distinctions here. So with that, um, back to you, Debbie. Okay, your next public hearing is um, second reading and consideration of a motion to adopt ordinance 8398 dockless bike share licensing ordinance update and e-scooter check-in. Good evening, City Council. Um, this evening, we're going to be presenting some information on the dike, uh, dockless bike share licensing ordinance change um, and an, an e-scooter check-in 
and some information about B cycle funding. And that presentation is going to be provided by DK Kemp. DK, pedal away. Thank you very much, Bill. And Council, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Oh, great. <clears throat> Okay, well, good evening, Mayor and City Council. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with you all this evening. My name is Dave Kemp, Senior Transportation Planner in the Go Boulder Work Group within the City's Transportation Division. Questions and comments you may have um, about each of tonight's discussion items. Next slide, please, Sarah. Sarah, next slide. I'm sorry, DK, having difficulty hearing you. I did go to the next slide. Do you need to go again? Um, let's, okay, great. Um, it should be on the second slide. I'm not seeing it. Discussion topics. Okay, okay, good. It's not registering on my screen, so I'll go ahead and speak to that slide. One second. Okay, um, for some reason, I'm having some technical difficulties um, with my computer. It's not advancing my notes, nor is it advancing the, the Zoom call. Can you still hear me all? We can, can hear you. Okay, I apologize for the technical difficulty. Um, please give me one second. I'll try to. Um, I'll poll council. Would council like a five minute break? Well, um, DK brings his presentation up. Okay, very good. We will take a five minute break, DK, and we'll be back in just a it. moment. Thank you very much. Yep. DK, I'm still here and happy to help you try to resolve the issue. Thanks. I'm going to reboot my computer right now. Okay. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay. Be with okay. you in a second. Hopefully that works. And uh, DK, this is Chris, perhaps turning off your incoming video and turning off your own video may help with any connection issues too. That's a great idea.
can do what? That these all should be roll call votes, not show of hands. And I did put that on his script because okay. there's an error dropped in an ordinance. Reminder from Debbie. Sarah, are you there? Yes. How are we doing? Do we have the uh, technical difficulties solved? Okay, has just rebooted and joined the meeting as a panelist. So I'm just waiting to hear from him if he can see the second slide as he would requested. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Damn. DK, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So you are promoted to a panelist again. You should be seeing on your screen tonight's discussion topic, slide number two. You're muted, I'm afraid. Can you unmute? It won't allow me. Wait, okay, I think this okay. might be working now. It wasn't allowing me to unmute. Can you see me okay? Yeah. Hear me okay? Yeah. DK, okay. you might try um, just turning off your video. I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna do that. I think maybe for the bandwidth might be bad. So um, bear with us one second. Okay. And then... Okay, so we can still hear you. And hopefully you okay. can see the slide is the list of discussion topics for this evening. Okay, just give me one second to get back to my PowerPoint here. Okay, Council, sorry about the technical difficulties tonight. Um, it wasn't allowing me to advance uh, my own notes in the PowerPoint, but um, okay, let's discuss uh, tonight's topics. Uh, tonight's discussion is divided into four parts. We'll begin tonight by explaining the details of the dockless bike share licensing ordinance, which is the, the second reading. And since the current ordinance sunsets on August 7th, 2020, uh, this ordinance needs to be adopted as an emergency measure in order for it to go into effect prior to the expiration of the formal ordinance. Um, following the presentation, council will have the opportunity to review and hopefully approve a motion adopting tonight's ordinance. Uh, following the details of the dockless bike share ordinance and per council's request, we will then discuss the current status of the Boulder bike share B-cycle and also describe a few potential scenarios moving forward with the organization. Staff would also like to conduct a brief check-in with council regarding the current e-scooter moratorium 
uh, which expires this October. We'd like to receive general feedback from council regarding or ordinance options and also describe a few ideas staff has potentially moving forward. And then finally, we'll discuss overall next steps uh, that will lead to the development of a comprehensive shared micromobility program for the city of Boulder. Okay, next slide, Sarah. Great, it's working, okay. Um, and so moving on to tonight's main event, we'd like to prevent, uh, present some of the details behind the update to the Dockless Bike Share Licensing Ordinance. Um, when staff initially developed the 2018 ordinance, the micromobility industry was quite different than it is today, uh, although the industry has been changing quite quickly ever since. Um, when the original ordinance was adopted in 2018, e-scooters were not even in cities yet, and the industry was mainly comprised of self-locking bikes that could be basically left anywhere. Um, additionally, the private sector startup companies were um, employing road techniques or tactics by deploying bicycles in cities without the consent of local government. Um, in order to avoid the negative impacts experienced by these other cities, staff jumped into the action and to prevent the legal deployment of these bikes, as we were primarily concerned with bikes being left on sidewalks and in crosswalks, causing an impediment to pedestrians, including people in wheelchairs and people with low vision. In other cities, bikes were also vandalized or discarded in riparian areas and even placed up in trees or other unfavorable locations. And again, we wanted to avoid these impacts. And so one of the important functions of the 2018 ordinance, however, was the requirement for uh, shared bikes to have lock to mechanism that would uh, require users to lock the bike to a bike rack each, um, after each use. And since then, uh, many of the micromobility companies have incorporated the lock to technology on their bikes. And while the industry does continue to change, we realize that the existing ordinance also needs to adapt to changing conditions to make it more favorable for micromobility companies to do business in Boulder. Next slide, slide, please. And so in preparation of the ordinance update, staff prepared a draft regulatory framework based on peer city uh, programs, community stakeholder feedback, observed best practices from the National Association for City Transportation Officials, otherwise known as NACTO, and then feedback from several shared micromobility companies. The framework is uh, organized by these categories before you. Next slide. And so what's changed? I'm gonna go through some of the key modifications um, that we've uh, updated the ordinance with here. And um, on this slide here, looking at the fleet size, the original ordinance called for an initial fleet of 150 vehicles to be deployed at the, um, the time of the, uh, initiating a program. Uh, we realize now that that was not enough and that 500 vehicles um, was more likely to suit the needs of, um, of the city of Boulder and then also um, works better with the uh, micromobility companies. The operators will also have an opportunity to increase their fleet by 20% if an average of the two rides per vehicle per day is achieved. And then in terms of rebalancing equity, we want to ensure that the underserved neighborhoods within the city also receive um, these bicycles and these communities will not be um, subject to the demand-based cap that we've built into the ordinance. Next slide. All right, and then um, in terms of pricing and equity again, social equity, um, we want to ensure that we, we can offer a, a low-income customer plan that waives any fees with vehicle deposits and offers an affordable cash um, payment option uh, with an unlimited trips under 30 minutes. And then we can also regulate the speeds of these vehicles as well using geofencing. For example, on multi-use paths, the speed limit is 15 miles per hour. And so we can regulate uh, the speed of the shared um, electric assist bicycles. Next slide, please. Great, and then uh, the technology has changed. The data reporting uh, has changed a lot, has evolved. And so now we can get real-time information using the mobility data specification. Uh, we also want to incentivize parking at on-street and off-street micromobility parking hubs. Um, and then again, what we did maintain is that e-bikes um, must be equipped with the lock two capabilities so that the users are parking their bikes to bike racks um, after each use. This helps with preventing vandalism and then also helps preventing, um, prevent bikes from being parked in the middle of sidewalks and in crosswalks, as I mentioned earlier. Next slide. Okay, uh, staff has engaged um, with numerous community stakeholders, including city boards and commissions, 
to understand the concerns and interests regarding the shared micromobility program, uh, including dockless and electric assist bikes. The community stakeholders are familiar with the various forms of micromobility, whether they consist of dock-based or dockless bikes, e-bikes or e-scooters. And there is a general community interest in e-bikes and people see a benefit for shared e-bikes given Boulder's uh, hilly terrain and need for longer trips across Boulder and, to, and also to connect to um, neighboring communities within the region. Um, included the stakeholders is Boulder Bike Share or B-Cycle and we'll discuss more about our coordination with them in just a few slides. And for the last year, transportation and community vitality staff have been participating in a shared micromobility subcommittee with CU Bowler to examine both bike and e-scooter share. And we've been working with the business community to also understand their interests and concerns. Um, members of the business community include, uh, I should say stakeholders of the business and community include the downtown business partners, the Boulder Chamber, and the Downtown Management Commission. Uh, additionally, staff has coordinated with Mobility for All, a Boulder County program whose goal is to promote accessible, affordable, and equitable multimodal transportation options for residents of all ages and abilities and to raise awareness uh, that transportation is a basic social, economic, and health need. Coordination with this organization has been very helpful in, for us to understand the social equity component of this ordinance. Uh, transportation management organizations such as Boulder Transportation Connections and Community Solutions have also been included in discussions as we think about the need for shared micromobility on the regional level. And finally, staff has reached out to other boards and commissions, including the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board and, of course, the Transportation Advisory Board. Next slide, please. And on March 9th, TAB voted to, the Transportation Advisory Board voted unanimously on the motion to approve the DACA Spike Share Ordinance update as pre presented before you tonight. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there has been a lot of change in the shared micromobility industry, including increased volatility um, since COVID-19 um, entered our community. Um, and so we've seen programs around the US um, go dormant. We've seen some of these companies exit the communities. Um, we've seen a lot of company mergers, some file for bankruptcy. And, and then also um, there's been a decrease in the venture capital um, providing a lot of the funding for these um, companies. And a lot of these companies are now seeking um, financial sustainability. Um, and so it's been a, a changing time um, for the micromobility sector. But regardless, um, uh, some of the companies have maintained operations, especially some of the smaller companies, and have seen an uptick in usage, um, likely due to uh, the reductions in transit use these days. Uh, several operators have provided comments um, on the dockless bike share, and we've worked to incorporate their feedback to make Boulder and its regulations more attractive and manageable in order, to, uh, in order for them to conduct, conduct business in Boulder and also meet our micromobility goals. And a few of their comments um, are before you in the column on the right. Next slide. Okay. Um, and so moving on to Boulder Bike Share. Um, in the second quarter of 2020, uh, which is right about the time that COVID-19 entered our community, uh, the Boulder Bike, oh, sorry, the, uh, the B-Cycle system provided about 10,000 trips, which is about 34% of the number of trips that's a system averaged in the second quarter from 2017 through 2019. So ridership has definitely been down. However, it should be noted uh, to that as a countermeasure to impacts of COVID-19, um, B-Cycle did increase um, the free trip periods for monthly and annual passes, and also dropped the price of its pay per trip pass down to $1 per ride. Um, as of now, these measures are still in effect and will likely stay through at least 2020, but it's a good, indication or it's a good sign of our um, local partner here to react and provide service um, transportation services in a time of need so kudos to um, B cycle for that um, so if, if the system revenue maintains um, at the qu uh, second quarter 2020 levels which is about 64 percent of their budget for the rest of 2020 and if their largest uh, pending sponsor renewal Google occurs um, they should have it uh, they should end the year with enough reserve to withstand having to implement any staffing reductions. This basically means that they're barely behind their budget uh, with a sponsorship increase from Google and the federal government's Paycheck Protection Program making up the difference. 
Um, if the city alone and not CU contributed to Boulder Bike Share's operations in early 2021, uh, the 50K subsidy that we have budgeted uh, currently in 2021 would extend Boulder Bike Share's operations by about six weeks. Um, this could force the organization to shut down the system as early as March 2021. If, however, CU also, play, can, uh, also contributed a significant level, the organization could operate into spring of 2021. Um, it is staff's goal to develop a shared micromobility program with a private sector company that can work in concert with B-Cycle. And we like, uh, we include criteria in the request for proposal guidelines for operators to identify strategies in order to do so. Uh, city and B-Cycle staff and board members are in the process of developing a strategic master plan. And we've identified a few potential scenarios moving forward and that we'd like to share with you tonight. Next slide. The first scenario is for Boulder Bike uh, Share to continue to own and operate the, um, the pedal bikes that are in service today, um, while also deploying B-Cycle electric bikes under a cost revenue share model with the corporate headquarters of B-Cycle, uh, which is TREC, uh, based out of Wisconsin. The second is a scenario, potential scenario, is that they would operate a system owned by a private dockless mobility company under a cost revenue share agreement um, or as a contractor. And then next slide, please. And uh, the third scenario would be for Boulder Bike Share to compete with other operators uh, for a contract to operate a system owned by the city, county, RTD, or VIA. Uh, the owning entity may purchase or take possession in exchange for the right to collect system revenue. At this time, staff doesn't recommend scenario number three as a viable option due to the financial responsibility of purchasing and operating new equipment, especially in the time of COVID-19 and significantly reduced funding and transportation, particularly to our transit systems. And then the fourth um, uh, scenario here is Boulder Bike Share would enter um, a partnership with the winner of the city's RFP request for proposal, um, incorporating new technology and agreeing on it constructive way to wind down the aging B-cycle and transfer 8,000 plus active members to the new platform. Um, at this time, staff leads number four is most likely the most viable path forward as it relies on the private sector, provide new technology, which is always evolving, and who could also provide greater accessibility throughout Boulder in a faster time frame. Given the city's uh, the transportation department's latest financial reductions due to COVID-19, the scenario makes the most financial sense at this time. Uh, to align all three sectors, pu private, public, and nonprofit, and work toward a mutually agreeable strategy to achieve the city's micromobility goals is our, is our aim. Uh, and this seems to have the most promise um, as of today. But nonetheless, we still have, um, these are just a preview of uh, potential scenarios and and we need to complete the strategic planning process with B-Cycle, and we'll be returning to council later this fall to share the results and hopefully a viable path forward for all parties. Next slide, please. D DK, if I could hold you up right there, Bob has a question. Okay. Bob, you're on mute. Hey, DK, so, sorry to interrupt you. It's pertinent to this point. Um, so I, so I understand that you're going to propose a $50,000 subsidy in the 2021 budget, will, which will be taken up here in a few weeks. Um, and it sounds like you won't have an idea which of these four scenarios will occur until after we approve the budget in October. Is that a fair assumption? Quite likely. Um, that is, um, that is a problem. I'm, at, this, at this point, we, we're pretty sure that we do not have, um, the money and transportation to go above and beyond the fifty thousand dollars that we currently have um, allocated for B cycle. Okay, um, and so if we allocated the fifty thousand towards B cycle in, in the approved budget in October, and then um, your scenario four, which you, you indicated is the most likely one, occurs, would we be able? Would we have to spend that whole fifty thousand, or is it possible that we would have some visibility before? Uh, we actually spent the subsidy in 2021 about whether um, there was a B cycle to subsidize. I think if you let me continue the, the presentation, I'm going to talk about how we're going to wrap all this together. Um, but I think that is a potential option, Bob, that we could um, look at if and how we spend that $50,000 depending upon 
bringing on a new provider and what that time frame looks like. Um, nonetheless, I, I think it's important that we um, do remember, consider um, that investing in our, in our local bike share um, is important to long-term success. And it's really gonna take that uh, you know, private, public, nonprofit partnership to make it work. Um, and so at, at least having that $50,000 available um, for our micromobility purposes, I, I think will be will behoove us in the long run. So Bob, if I could, I think the simplest answer to your question, not saying, not disagreeing with anything DK said, is that yes, we could choose not to spend that money, even if it were allocated. We could simply choose to spend it on something else. Okay, well maybe we'll we'll revisit this when we get to the budget in um, September and October and you guys might have a little bit more guidance for us at that point in time. Absolutely. Great, thanks. Okay, next slide please. Okay, the, the third part of these of the discussion tonight is to do a check-in with council uh, regarding the, e the current e-scooter e moratorium. Um, in March of 2020, staff was asked to bring a continued six month moratorium on issuing business licenses to com companies offering shared e-scooters, primarily because of COVID-19. Um, and data collection since then on safety and sustainability has been rather stagnant um, due to um, some of the issues we discussed earlier. Um, however, staff still does not recommend including standing e-scooters as part of its shared micromobility mobility program due to past safety um, problems. Uh, but since the January 20th City Council study session, staff has investigated a new sit-down style of e-scooter. Uh, these vehicles are relatively new and in operation in only a handful of cities. Um, there is currently no substantive data, though, available at this time regarding their safety and sustainability apart from favorable statistics that have um, been provided by the operators themselves. However, the vehicle's componentry and other specifications indicate that these devices would be more durable and would handle variable pavement conditions more effectively uh, while offering the, the rider a lower center of gravity. Um, staff recognizes that the Transportation Advisory Board, some council members, and the Boulder Chamber are interested in experimenting with other forms of mi micromobility. And it's mainly due to the design of these vehicles that we feel comfortable experimenting with seated e-scooters as part of the shared micromobility program, as we feel it's a more of a calculated risk worth taking. Next slide, please. And just to provide uh, a, a little better understanding tonight about what sets these uh, vehicles apart from the, sit, the seated scooters, apart from the stand-up scooters, um, is looking at some of their design features, um, including, of course, the seat, which offers that lower center of gravity, um, a larger wheel diameter, which is um, better for variable pavement conditions, a higher ground clearance if they were to um, hit a pothole, um, and we understand that these have an anticipated longer lifespan. So from a sustainability standpoint, um, they seem to be um, a better choice. Next slide, please. And so we wanted to present um, just a few ordinance options um, for you tonight to get you thinking about um, what, where you might like to go with the e-scooters. And number one here is the indefinite prohibition against licensing businesses um, offering shared e-scooters of all types. Number two is to discontinue the e-scooter moratorium altogether and allow the business, licensing of businesses offering shared e-scooters of all types. And then third is kind of a hybrid, um, which is the indefinite prohibition against licensing the businessing, businesses offering standing e-scooters with a caveat to offer shared seated e-scooters potentially in a designated area. In preparation, um, of returning to city council uh, later this fall, um, some of your guidance tonight on uh, if these are the right um, ordinance options um, would be great. Um, if these are the right ones or if there's more that you'd like to see, we'd like to know. Next slide, please. Okay, and then to wrap all this together, um, uh, here's transportation's uh, seven steps to successfully developing a shared micromobility program for the city of Boulder. Um, and so tonight, uh, we, we hope that the um, that city council will adopt the updated dockless bike share licensing ordinance. And then also we can get a, um, a little better sight on uh, which direction you'd like to go for the shared e-scooters. 
Um, and then later this summer too, we'll finalize the city manage, manager roles component of the dockless ordinance and then um, work with B-Cycle to complete the strategic planning process. And then this fall, winter, um, we'll return to city council for three items. Um, one is the e-scooter ordinance options, and you pick one. And then the regulation of human electric powered vehicles on streets and paths. Where can these human electric powered vehicles be allowed to operate? There are certain ordinances that prevent or preclude them from operating in certain locations. So we want to visit that and make sure that the micromobility program um, is consistent with local ordinances. And then we'd also share the results of the B-Cycle strategic plan um, process. And then uh, later to here, we would develop, oh, following that, so I, I should say that, 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 would, that those three items right there would complete the policy work um, that we need to do in order to move forward with the development of the RFP guidelines, and then we may release it um, and then go into the operator selection and contractual phase. And then as anticipated by spring of 2021, we would be able to um, implement, commence a new um, micromobility shared program with the vehicles um, of your choice. Okay. <clears throat> um, I, it's time for council questions. Mark has a question, I believe. Yeah, um, with respect to the, the granting of uh, effect a monopoly uh, position to an operator, is that to benefit them or to benefit the community? It's to benefit both the community and the operator. Um, if, if you begin to, if you introduce more than one operator, then um, you're essentially digging into the profitability of the company to operate successfully within the uh, the city. And so that used to happen quite a bit um, when the when the micromobility companies were having cash burn contests because they were going through their venture capital cash and they didn't really have any worries at the time about spending a lot of money because it was there to spend. But all, you know, a lot of that has changed now and that venture capital is, um, is drying up. And so um, having the market open to uh, two or more companies um, then digs into the, to the viability of the, um, the organization's success. I, I guess I'm, I'm a little unclear about that. I mean, we would not protect a restaurant from competition. The concept of protecting a, an operator that comes in under an RFP and granting the monopoly status is, is to me a little bit problematic. Um, I, it's common with RFPs to do this. So this is the approach that we took with Boulder B Cycle in the very beginning to offer one contractor um, the ability to provide docked based um, bike share. I understand your concerns though about the, the, um, the monopoly piece, but we do risk um, the potential of um, companies not applying for the RFP and or if they do and we award several licenses, then um, we could then lose them. We would leave our market. And so there is a lot of risk right now within the micromobility um, industry in terms of um, the companies being able to be profitable and to stay within a community. And we've seen them exit from different communities. There's been a lot of shifting around. Um, and right now we feel that this is probably the best way um, to attract a company and then keep them here. Um, as well as for the community, having having one um, platform is better than having multiple. And my, my second question is, the increase in the fleet from 150 to 500, was there a particular rationale for that? Or is it just a, a nice round number? Uh, <laughs> I mean, was, it, was there some yeah. purposeful calculation that, that led to 500 as opposed to 400 or 700? Yes. So, well, the 150 originally was um, developed because we didn't want to inundate the community at the time with um, these shared bikes being, you know, placed all over. Um, we found that that number was also not financially viable for the companies to operate with that few of uh, vehicles. But 150 bicycles also throughout the city of Boulder wouldn't have been enough to um, really provide the accessibility that we want to provide. Um, including gun barrel. And so um, looking at best practices from around the country and cities our size, um, 500 was a, um, a good start that other cities had employed and, 
and from there they were able to um, ramp up the number of bikes depending upon how many rides per day they achieved. And were those other cities of similar size to Boulder? They were, yeah. It's always hard to get, you know, directly, you know, the, uh, the 110,000 um, population count, but um, very similar. All right, thank you. Great, and I have, <clears throat> Bob, I have your hand up. Is it, do you have a question? I do. Okay, you're up and then Mary. I think Mary was actually ahead of me. Okay, great. Mary? I don't think so, but I'll go ahead. <laughs> um, thanks for the presentation, DK. Um, yeah. My first question is about the um, dockless bikes. And the locking, does it allow for um, locking only to bike racks or could a person lock them to a stop sign, to other city signage, um, other, you know, a table, um, things like that, or is it only allowed in a on a bike rack? Technically, they the, the bike um, could be locked to any fixed object, um, and then once you lock the bike, it's registered as um, parked. However, through the education and through the app on the um, the micro mobility companies, I should say, applica you know, mobile application, they're encouraged to lock at a bike rack as opposed to a stop sign or a tree, for example, and, and whatnot. So there's um, more education on the side of where and how to operate the vehicle, but technically the bicycle could be locked to any fixed object. Okay, thank you. Um, and then on the um, low income, um, cost. It was set at the federal, at or below the federal poverty level. Um, what was the rationale behind setting it that low? And so the exact, um, in, in terms of developing the, the social equity program, there's more work we need to do um, with our social equity team to determine what the, um, the appropriate pricing structure um, would be for that, and that would be part of the city manager rules and development of the city manager rules component. Um, and so it would be that probably um, at the, the federal poverty level. Is there any reason why it couldn't mirror the, the threshold for the income-based fare, which is 185% FPL? It absolutely could, and that's great input um, for us tonight to hear in terms of um, developing the final price pricing structure. Yeah, that would be, I think that would be a great way to um, take advantage of people who have applied and have gotten the low income base fare, then they could just show that and then immediately qualify. So, um, and then my last question um, on the options that you presented for the, um, the partnerships and the contracts, um, do would any of those pass on any kind of um, savings to the end users? Um, could you uh, clarify your question again? Um, you... So the, the options, there were I think like four options and the fourth one I think was the most likely. Oh yes, the options with Boulder um, bike share, potential scenarios moving forward. Right, right. Would any of those, if there were any kind of savings to be had, would that be passed on to the end user? Hmm. It's a good question. Um, I would have to think about that further. Okay. I can't hear you tonight. Sorry. Okay, no problem. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Great. Bob? DK, I had three questions. Um, I saw in the memo that um, your proposal with respect to a, um, a new dockless entrant um, would either increase or decrease that 500 bike allotment um, <clears throat> based upon their rides per vehicle per day. And I think you talked about increasing if they're averaging higher than two rides per vehicle per day and maybe decrease if they were below one per day. Just so we can have some context around that, can you share with us what um, B-Cycle was doing and, and, and probably not during COVID because that's unfair, but do you, you happen to know off the top of your head what they're your average rides per vehicle per day last year was for B-Cycle? 
I don't have that information available right now, Bob. It's a great question. I can get back to you on that. Okay, thanks. A kind of a related question. Do, um, so, you know, a couple of years ago, we we said, well, we would be willing to experiment with this with dockless, um, but no more than 150 bikes. Um, and you know, at at the time we were debating it, there were seems there was three or four companies, Lime, Lime and Bird, and so on and so forth, that all wanted to come in and. And then we, we made the limit 150 and we got crickets, right? No one came in. Yeah. Um, and so now we're proposing to increase that to 500. Have we talked to people, but you also said that, that the industry is really, really suffering right now. Have we talked to people in the industry? Do we have any idea if we issued an RFP for an exclusive um, contract with 500 bikes, whether we'd get any takers? Do you have any, any sense from the industry whether that's a su sufficient number and that we'll actually have multiple bidders? Yes, I've talked with uh, two uh, two companies within the private sector that have expressed interest in operating in Boulder with the um, the regulations that we've provided. Okay, great. And then finally, moving on to um, the seated e-scooters. I know they're a relatively recent phenomenon. Do you have an idea? You know, I think we're going to, well, at least I'm going to be continue to be concerned about safety. Um, I do understand that they may be safer than the types of stand-up scooters that we um, decline to allow. Um, do you know what the rate of adoption is in those cities that have um, experienced seated e-scooters so that we could get some um, safety data? I mean, is this something that if we waited three or six months, we're gonna get lots of good safety data or is the rate of adoption slower than that and we would just, we would have to be at the forefront of this? So again, the, the, the companies um, themselves have provided some of their data, um, their safety data, and it's looking a lot better. Um, than the standing e-scooter companies. Um, and I think this is something that we would um, prepare and bring back as part of the ordinance options, some additional information that we could find uh, around the safety and sustainability of these devices so that you okay. can make a decision. Okay, I'd be, I would be more interested in safety data from the cities themselves. Okay, very good. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. Great. And I have another hands up. So <clears throat> I want to say thank you, PK and, and um, your co-workers for this great summary and presentation. Um, my one question is going to sound snarky, but it's not. Um, what is the difference between a seated e-scooter and an e-bike? So I'm sure there's lots of flavors, but is it that there's no pedal system and you don't pedal? Um, you know, and then I would ask a, an attendant question, what's the difference between, you know, a, a, a seated e-scooter and the kinds of vehicles that are typically sold as, as scooters? So can you, can you talk about how the e-scooter concept has evolved and how, what differentiates it? Sure. And so the e-scooter is different from an, an electric assist bicycle and that electric assist, electric assist bicycle does have a, a chain drive. Um, it's uh, you pedal and it, it, it powers the back wheel. Um, and while and then and then the um, sit the seated e-scooter um, basically just has a throttle. It has foot pegs but no pedals that would um, function. And so uh, it goes by just pushing the button, um, <laughs> so to speak. And, and there are versions of electric bikes these days which are sold as e-bikes, which don't require pedaling, right? Uh, I think most of them, you can pedal, but not all of them require pedaling. That's true. The, the class two e-bike, um, while it does offer the, um, the pedal assist, there's also an option to use a throttle in order um, for it to propel itself. Okay. So I, I guess the only reason I'm asking the question is I'm is it is it the pedaling action, the inability of seated e-scooters to have a pedaling action that that makes them distinct from call it class two e-bikes? Yeah, I I would say that is um, definitely a the, the most the, the most important characteristic that makes the distinction between the two vehicles. Um, I would also say that e-bikes are built. A little bit more robustly, and the seated e-scooters um, are a bit more small, are a bit smaller um, in nature. And um, while they, I think they both have probably the same stopping power. Um, the the design of the vehicle is just a bit smaller than the e-bike, I would say. Okay, very good. 
I do not see any other questions. Um, if there's no objection, I would turn to public comment at this point. Okay, I see no obje objections, so I will see if I can pull my list up. Okay, so <clears throat> um, I've got the list up. Sarah, are we ready to go with um, we are public comment? We are on the timer right now. Okay, very good. And just in preparation, we have six people, so there will be three minutes allowed per. Um, and the first three speakers will be Lynn Siegel, Mark Gelband, and Judd, Judd Valeski. So Lynn is up when you're ready, Sarah. Lynn, you're on the air. I'd just like to wonder why we are looking into all these expensive projects, like the thing that the condos that were approved above. Um, above the janitorial service on Pearl Street, you know, all of this, all of these projects, all of this big bike stuff, when we're in a freaking depression here, there's a big pause here. All the money that you're spending every day, all of my tax dollars that you are spending is going to really stretch out this depression a lot more than it needs to be. Why are we spending all of this? First of all, there's no transportation problem right now, right? Because nobody's going anywhere. So why all of this? Community cycles, can, you know, you can do something like in Europe or somewhere where I know I'm on the wrong continent, clearly, but somewhere that's much lo more low profile than, than all of this, you know, with just taking the tons of bikes. I've been down a community cycle. They just throw out tons of bikes all the time just refurbishing those bikes, having community cycle, the local group refurbish the bikes. So what if people just take them and steal them, just move them, get them out in the society. And, you know, as far as parking them somewhere and having them come back to the right place, do community policing for that. So it's unacceptable for people to stash their bike in the middle of the street when they're done using it. Um, just more low profile type of an approach to this whole thing. This is not rocket science here. This is not like, um, you know, it might be useful for a, for a situation like this. If you're gonna do some motorized vehicles, going out to Gun Barrel, going from North to South Boulder or something, but not for regular bikes. It doesn't make sense. It's, it's over expensive and in a virus now, and with everything breaking down and with much less resources for everything, you know, homeless list rampant, you know, um, um, ev ev evictions, um, no jobs, you know, a an immediate transfer transformation of the whole society from, from lots of jobs to no jobs. Um, and, and how universal basic income is going to be accommodating that. Instead, we've got, you know, $1,200 we throw out to people in unemployment comp. There's not clearly, you know, and, and there's no hopes that this is going to change November 3rd. No way. So let's just be reasonable about how we're spending city funds and, and bring it down a notch. We don't have to build all this new stuff up and we don't have to have these huge companies developing this stuff. How Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. So next we have Mark Gelband, who does not appear to be in the meeting. If he joins the meeting, we'll put him in at the end. Um, so we have Judd Bileski, Karen Hassan, and Edie Ore. So Judd, you're up. Great. Thanks, uh, everyone. And thanks, DK, for the... Uh, the great update there. Uh, Jed Valeski here, Boulder resident uh, and prior founder and operator of a, uh, a dockless uh, bike share uh, type program. Uh, left that a couple of years ago, but do have some experience in the arena. As, as was pointed out, there's been a lot of evolution in this space, uh, obviously, and I like the the recommendation for seated versus stand e-scooters, uh, for sure. I think that's that's a, a big safety positive. One thing I think communities 
uh, a few years ago and still today are overlooking is the parking dynamic um, of these things and and on device locks that allow you to lock to uh, various bike racks or stop signs, whatever you want it to be, are helpful. Uh, but if you go around small as well as large communities that have taken these types of dockless programs on, you'll find the communities littered with these bikes, whether they're self-locking or they have these independent locking mechanisms. One, one, one thing we thought would not, uh, was not desirable, I think has turned out to be desirable, which was the actual dock itself. Um, it forced the user to corral and, and place the transportation device back in a confined and defined location. And what we had initially predicted as, as being positive user behavior absolutely turned out not to be true at all whatsoever, even with the on-device uh, on locking mechanisms. People just wound up locking, them, lock, locking the devices to themselves in the middle of the sidewalk. Um, and so I, I would encourage everyone to consider the parking dynamic over the device itself. I think the device itself is actually secondary. It's where these things wind up at the end of the day. And in general, all over the US, they wind up just littering the sidewalks and boulders in a highly constrained uh, storage parking, whether it's automobile or bicycle today, highly constrained parking dynamic as it is. And so I'd encourage us to uh, be pursuing docked solutions. Uh, that's my big thing is just the uh, the parking dynamic and these things getting scattered all over the place. So with focus there, I'd love to see something like this in the system. Thanks. Thank you, Jed. So next, Karen Hassan, <clears throat> Edie Ure, and Andrea Manikel. Uh, Karen? So I am not seeing a Karen Hassan in the meeting. Okay, great. Um, Edie Ure and Andrea Menegel. So is Edie here? I don't see Edie in the meeting either. I do believe Andrea is here. Okay, let's move to Andrea. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Karen. All right. Uh, Andrea Menegal representing the Boulder Chamber at 2440 Pearl Street. As many of you know, improving workforce mobility and transportation choices in this community has been a key priority of the Boulder Chambers. Over the years, we've engaged in collaborative efforts with the university, the city, county, industry experts, and other partners across the region. COVID-19 continues to present uncertainty about how our workforce commutes. But what we've known in Boulder is that we need to continue to meet the challenges head on through innovative solutions and providing a variety of ways that citizens and workers can make their trips. Not only to reduce future congestion on our roads, but also to reduce the transportation expenses that they incur. As we look across the landscape, we're seeing a depleted regional transit agency. We're seeing micro mobility companies falling day by day, and we're seeing our transportation budgets tighten. These conditions make it imperative that we seek to attract the type of providers that can creatively offer sustainable solutions to our mobility challenges. We believe staff is doing just that with this ordinance. We encourage flexibility in the regulations so that providers can be creative and responsive to the current market fluctuations and about what they can offer Boulder. The remaining providers have the firsthand knowledge of what can be accomplished now and how to run these services. Through the partnerships the team at Go Boulder has established with the Chamber, the University, BTC, B-Cycle, and others, we have confidence that the city staff understands the needs in the community and we can continue to collaboratively explore solutions to fit Boulder's needs. The Chamber will continue to communicate what we understand about our workforce mobility challenges, will continue to be a conduit for identifying private sector solutions, and we will continue as a dedicated partner for developing 
uh, the strategies to address our needs during this unique and challenging time. Thank you to all the staff working on this and for all your efforts to support finding these solutions. Great, thank you, Andrea. So with that, I will bring this back to council and um, see if we have any discussion and perhaps move to a motion. So I am seeing no hands up and um, I think generally what that means is we might be ready to move to a motion. Is there anyone who would like to put a motion on the table? Um, just as a formality, the, there is a suggested motion that staff has prepared on the second to the last slide. If we can show that just to help out. Yes, and it's on page 82 of our packet as well. Good, thank you. Okay, so I will jump in and uh, put a motion out. Um, I move that we adopt emergency ordinance 8398 amending title four um, licenses and permits by amending chapter 20 fees and chapter 31 dockless bike share and setting forth related details. Second. Very good. We have a motion and a second. Um, and I didn't see any uh, suggested changes to what staff has put together. Um, so, Mary, I see your hand. I do. Um, well, actually, I guess the um, the change in going from uh, setting the low income uh, rate from federal at or below federal poverty level to 185 FPL would be in the city manager rule. So is it necessary for me to make an amendment? No. Okay, cool. Oh, Okay, and Mark, I see your hand. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's more in the way of a, of a question. Um, and I'm going back to the comment of uh, the earlier gentleman who cautioned against uh, going dockless as opposed to docked. Um, do, what do we contemplate as the term of any agreement with a provider if we find that um, we're suffering adverse consequences in, in terms of where these bikes are are left and and uh, and and parked. Um, how will we amend our policies um, if if it becomes necessary to do so? I mean, are we going to be locked into a ten-year contract, a five-year contract? Hi, Mark. This is DK. This is DK. Mm -hmm. um, we can divide, we can create the contract between the city and the micro mobility provider um, for one year, for two years, for three years accordingly. Um, and in terms of, and I think you're referring to um, parked bikes, bikes parked um, improperly? Yes. Okay. And so we, the, there is a caveat or a stipulation within the ordinance um, that requires the vendor to provide an identifier on each bike. And then the user or the complaint, the, uh, the person making the complaint um, would call the operator and, uh, excuse me, yeah, call the micro mobility company. And then they have two hours then to remove the bike from um, its improper park location. And then if the bike isn't parked, then the city can um, um, incur a fine um, on that provider. Thank you. And if I, if I may just um, elaborate to within the city manager rules, we have um, key performance indicators um, that we would examine on a quarterly basis and their customer service and response times improperly parked bikes or bikes that are not functioning um, is included in those performance metrics. Okay. All right, I think that gives some protection. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. And so Debbie reminded me <clears throat> that we need to tidy up something from our last vote. But before we go there, let's finish this one up. Um, if there's no further discussion, there's a motion and a second, and this is a roll call vote. Councilmember Wallach? Aye. Weaver? Aye. Yates? Aye. Young? Yes. 
Um, Council Member Brockett. Friend? Yes. Joseph? Yes. Nagel? Aye. Swetlick? Yes. Mayor, okay. the motion passes unanimously. Very good. And Debbie, how would you like to clean up our last vote? Um, the previous vote was supposed to be a roll call vote. And so if I recall correctly, we had two votes. One was five to three. And so is it sufficient to name the three who voted against the measure? I already pulled that. So we don't really need to clean anything up. I, oh. I took care of that, so. Okay, very good. Thank you, Debbie. Sure. So in Thank you, case, City Council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bill, much appreciate keeping, keeping moving on this, even in the face of the headwinds we've got. Very good. Have a good evening. Thank you. Do we, do we need to give, provide guidance on scooters or is that, or do we do that? Well, we made the motion and I, I wasn't sure, uh, maybe that's a question for staff. Staff, do you need further guidance tonight on scooters? Well, with the three ordinance options that we presented this evening, um, we didn't hear any disagreement that those were not the right ones or if there were any additional. Okay. And so okay. That's the case, then we'll move forward with those three options. And bring them back okay. That's fine. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, I believe that Rachel had a um, process point that she wanted to bring up at this point. Rachel? That, yep, that's true. Um, before we look at the all night parking issue, I wanted to see if we could um, listen to staff presentation and public okay. hearing, but then hold off on the discussion and vote for two weeks so that we could have the benefit of next week's homelessness um, issues discussion. I think that this ordinance could impact people who are living out of their vehicles. And um, I imagine that we will learn more next week about how COVID has impacted um, homelessness. And I think we're also getting a recommendation from HRC and HAB to look at safe parking. So I just think it would be helpful if we had the benefit of next week's study session before we decide on this. So my request would be to have the um, presentations because the people are here tonight and then have the discussion and vote in two weeks if possible. Did that make sense? Do I need to make anything more formal? Well, so I have a question. Um, so if, uh, for staff, I think this would be for Tom. What's the rationale behind addressing this matter? Um, or somebody. You may recall this is the end. I think we've been here three or four times on this ordinance. Uh, we've lopped off pieces of it. We asked to do this because the municipal court uh, found an ambiguity in the language of our parking ordinance and refused to allow us to enforce it. So we rewrote the ordinance to accommodate that change. So I would ask that you go forward with this. And if you need to make changes, you can make changes. Um, this is a long-standing policy. All we're trying to do is clean it up. Um, and uh, as I said, I think we've prepared this and put it before council like three or four times now. Um, it it yeah. should be controversial. There's something else that I'd like to add, which um, council may not be aware of. We actually have um, another uh, code section that's more on point to the issue that's being raised. And that's Section 563, which is unlawful use of vehicle as a residence. So that's something that's actually directly on point to what you may have in mind. This ordinance is really directed more towards um, parking related to trailers and, you know, commercial vehicles and that sort of thing. So for what that's worth, I thought I'd share that with you. I appreciate the clarification. I think I, I asked at CAC and was told that this would this could though directly impact people who are living in vehicles. So I'll ask another question. Um, the ordinance that we're addressing tonight, um, does it, would it address 
vans and and vehicles. So it's mainly aimed at trailers. I think it, inc it includes RVs. Sandra, do you, does it include vans? It, in it includes uh, motorhomes, trailers, um, commercial vehicles. Um, vans would not be included in this. So, okay. So, so I have a follow-up follow, follow question to Mary's question, which is, <clears throat> is it just towed RVs? Because there's two flavors of RVs, right? There's the fifth wheel, the towed RV, and then there's the self-powered RV. So is this really focused on vehicles which detach from the motive power? It's both. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So I, I think Rachel, if you, I, I'm not hearing a lot of response. So I, I'm uh, Adam and then Bob. Yeah, just a process thing. If we were to move it another week, the only problem with that is it's supposed to be a study session and then we'd have to have a public hearing if I'm thinking correctly. So that might complicate that doesn't mean we couldn't do it, but just bring that up. Mm. The other issue, just to put this out there, is that we're pretty jammed up on schedule going forward for the next couple of months. So it, that would raise the, I mean, we're looking at a very long meeting for the 21st and then a, um, a pretty long hearing at the special meeting on the 28th. So for what it's worth, delay here I'm not sure when we pick it back up. Um, so um, I have another question. Would it be possible to include the ordinance that Sandra pointed out that is more on point um, within the study session memo so that we have that in front of us as we have the study session next week? Um, and then also include this one perhaps. Um, and then we can look at them both and see if there needs to be any further changes. Um, so my suggestion would be to go ahead with tonight's ordinance and then include it in the memo um, as passed and then the include the other ordinance, which is more on point, um, in the study session memo as well. Would that be possible? Well, the study session memo has already been published. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. We could do an addendum, uh, revise the memo online and publish something on hotline, if that would be helpful. That would work for me. Okay, I'd be happy to do that. Okay, I've got Bob. I was, I was gonna make a, a similar suggestion. Uh, first of all, I, I think Rachel makes, makes a very good point, um, but, I, but I think the ordinance that before us actually goes beyond um, you know, sleeping in, in campers. Um, and as Sandra pointed out, um, we do have another ordinance. So I was gonna make the same suggestion. Why don't we see if we can pass this tonight, but then let's talk about um, whether there are, after we have our discussion at say session next week, whether there are changes to what we do tonight or changes to the other ordinance that might come out of that. Maybe there'll be um, an appetite for that or maybe there won't be. And if, if there is an appetite for it, the CAC can then schedule um, further adjustment to the ordinance that we might pass tonight. Okay. Okay. So I, I'm hearing what sounds like consensus on moving ahead with this tonight, but including it in the uh, study session discussion next week. Well, that clear? What I heard was including the ordinance that prohibits sleeping in cars. And whatever heard, we pass tonight. And whatever we yeah. pass. I, I heard both, so. All right, thank you for the clarification. Okay, with that, let's do the staff presentation. All right, great. Um, I, I do have a presentation tonight. Um, and, and there and it is. For the, for the record, this is Sandra Yana. She's a deputy city attorney. Good evening, council. Um, uh, also on uh, the call tonight is uh, Chris Jones, who's the deputy director of the Community Vitality and Leo Pelly, uh, Parking Services and Enforcement Supervisor. All right, next slide, please. So 
Whoa, it's not moving. There we go. Okay, perfect. Um, so the intent of this proposed ordinance 8402 is to provide clarity um, to uh, the public regarding time limits for allowing certain vehicles to park on, on the street. Um, it's necessary, as um, Tom mentioned earlier, uh, because of a municipal court ruling that found the time limits um, to be vague. Um, parking enforcement receives many complaints and requests for enforcement of this provision. It's a recurring problem because trailer owners move their trailers up and down the street to avoid enforcement, but it's still in the same vicinity of the neighborhood. One of the arguments uh, proposed by a defendant in a recent case was that he was not in violation because he was moving um, the trailer a few feet every day. The code is intended to prevent individuals from using the street as a storage facility for their trailers and instead encourage use of private property off the street. This prohibition is similar to what many uh, HOAs have in place through covenants. Next slide. These are examples of uh, the types of vehicles addressed by this code section. Um, the red trailer that you see is actually uh, a shaving ice stand that the, mo the owner would move a few feet each day, but left on the street um, pretty much all of the winter months. So these are just a few examples of what uh, this code section addresses. Next slide. So subsection B prohibits parking of certain vehicles on any street unless they fall within one of the listed exceptions. And the exceptions are under B1, 2, and 3. Um, on this slide, you can see it's highlighted number one. Uh, it allows parking for a maximum of 48 consecutive hours, so long as the vehicle is parked on the street frontage of the registered vehicle's owner. Next slide. B2 is intended for contractors, landscapers, et cetera, um, that are providing a service to the nearby homeowner and therefore allows more time, a uh, maximum of 72 hours. Next slide. B3 provides the ability to request a permit if a greater length of time is required. And it complements the existing right-of-way permit process that currently exists. An example of three might be a contractor that is working on a longer, bigger project for a homeowner that might need additional time beyond um, 72 hours. Next slide. And lastly, um, subsection C is intended to further clarify the issue related to the tolling of time by not allowing for the clerk, excuse me, for the clock to restart if the vehicle moves to another location on a street. Next slide. That's it. Okay. Very good. <clears throat> Thank you for the presentation. Very to the point. Much appreciated. Of course. Um, <laughs> so are there questions? Uh, Rachel. Um, start my video back up. Yeah, uh, two, I think. One, I just wanted to understand, like, let's say that I live in a big apartment complex or something like that, where where would I be able to legally park that for 72 hours? There's no, like, street frontage right there right. for me. So as long as it's located uh, directly on the street frontage, so the, the street that you know, is either on one side or the other of the building, then that should be okay. Okay, and all those, I guess, just allow on street parking. I don't know, I, I, I haven't paid attention to that. Like, do all apartment, like massive complexes have ample parking? Well, uh, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I think most apartment complexes do have their own parking. Um, cause I've lived in a number and, and like the, the spots that I would get like outside my apartment wouldn't fit a trailer. So if I was reliant on street parking, sometimes they're on busy streets without a lot of parking. So just, I, I guess my second question is, did we run this perchance through, um, our new equity tool 
I think we're maybe still trialing it, but are we fairly certain that this wouldn't have negative impacts on um, certain? Well, the, the um, current uh, ordinance doesn't allow for any parking for more than 24 hours. And so this is just providing an, another additional time up to 48 hours um, so long as there's some connection with um, where the vehicle owner lives, um, rather than just having it on a street randomly throughout the city. Yeah, I, I understand um, what we're going for with it. I guess while we're retooling it, I, I would think that we would want to make sure it's equitable. So that's, I'm just wondering if we, if we did, if we were able to run it through the tool. No, we're just addressing the municipal court's ruling and trying to address just the vagueness of the tolling of time, so. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Great, I think we should probably go to public comment in that case. This. Okay, so Sarah, are you ready to go? I see the timer up. I am. I will note that it looks like the fourth person on the list is not in the meeting. So I believe we have three speakers this evening. Okay, very good. And so the three speakers we have are Riley Mancuso, Darren O'Connor, and Sean Collins. So we will start with Riley Mancuso. Hi. Um, Hello again, Council. Um, I'm Riley Mancuso. I introduced myself earlier. So um, what I want to talk about tonight is, um, as a council member friend pointed out, this is in fact a law that is so discriminatory towards people who are living in vehicles um, because they cannot afford housing that it's almost specifically targeting them. Um, so I want to read uh, from a letter that the ACLU sent when they threatened to sue the city of Mountain View, California, known for being the headquarters of Google and one of the most expensive cities in the United States, where hundreds of people live in their cars. Now, of course, Boulder is not nearly at this scale, but our housing policies are pushing us in this way. Uh, and if, like Mountain View, we try to adopt what is functionally a ban on overnight parking, um, uh, we will be, um, well, I'll, I'll read what the ACLU wrote. An overnight oversized vehicle parking prohibition would make it impossible for people who reside in vehicles such as vans, trailers, and recreational vehicles to live anywhere in Mountain View, replace Mountain View with Boulder and all of these things, even though Mountain View is unable to offer these residents indoor shelter space. An overnight parking ban would therefore violate the state and federal constitutions because a ban would disproportionately deny housing to people with disabilities and likely people of color. It would also violate the Fair Housing Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act. So I really want the council to think long and hard, as I've asked you in the past, to think about how the laws that you're passing, even when they don't explicitly have to do with race and class, in fact have to do with race, with disability, with class, and with all forms of marginalization. So think about the actual impact that this law is going to have on some of the most vulnerable people in your city. Um, Think about the amount of stress that trying to sleep in a car while being constantly hassled, living in fear of being ticketed and summoned to court um, by police for sleeping and occupying a space. Um, I also want to point out that the way that the draft seems to be written, uh, it says no camper, motorhome, or trailer shall be parked on any street. Uh, and then the only exceptions are for by permit, for workers or for the owner. So I'm wondering, you know, if I'm a person, if I'm a tourist and I want to walk down Pearl Street and buy an expensive puzzle, I can't park my RV on Pine Street for an hour. Uh, that seems like a real flaw in the language. But most importantly, I digress. Think about the impact that this will have on unhoused residents and please make a decision that is not inhumane. Thank you. Thank you, Riley. Uh, next, we have Darren O'Connor, Sean Collins, and Jennifer Darren? 
Okay, so I first want to just say that I second everything Riley just shared about the disparate impact. And, and we, you know, supposedly have all these equity tools to pay attention to these kind of issues and policy changes, and there's no sign of it being used here. But I want to move on to the fact that, that this ordinance is trying to solve a problem, uh, a, a void for vagueness issue at the court on the existing law. But then you know, we're hearing from our city attorney and assistant city attorney that, um, you know, to all the questions, well, we're solving that problem, but how many more are we creating? For example, uh, as Riley pointed out, no one can park an RV unless they own it, and then they can park it in front of their house for a short amount of time. So what if grandma and grandpa, which I've had happen, come visit in their RV and you live in an apartment and they park it on the street, they don't, they're the registered owner, it's not their home they're parking in front of. So you have immediately a right to travel problem with this law that you really ought to be thinking hard about. And going back to the drawing board, I know um, Tom Carr is expressing frustration at having you know, had to put this off several times and I can understand that frustration, but if you draft a law that is this exclusionary and literally tells people that your family can't visit in their motor home, uh, you, you've created more problems than you're solving. So I don't have much more to say on that other than, again, you know, Riley was spot on that this has gross race and class issues that it impacts, but it, it's, it's also basically telling even people that we would normally, you know, it, if we admit that we don't want homeless people sleeping in vehicles, period, um, and we would take that as a given. This law is still exclusionary to just about anyone who would come on vacation in a motorhome here, uh, or a or a fifth wheel or anything like that, unless they have a place to park it on their family's property. Um, and there's just so many places in Boulder where you, where that would not be the case. So you've excluded family from visiting under those conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Um, we have Sean Collins and Jennifer Sun. Sean. Hello, uh, my name is Sean Collins. I live in Boulder. Um, I want to echo what um, both Riley and Darren said. They make great points. Um, one thing that I want to talk about is I think that the memo from staff is misleading. It makes it seem like this is like a routine, like like legal language change, um, merely to keep up with current legal precedents, it says, um, and from to fix it from being unconstitutionally vague, but this is actually an expansion of police powers. Um, in this cultural moment, it's clear that people, including me, want you to div divest from policing and invest in social services. Instead of reducing the scope of police powers like you should be doing, you'd be increasing them with this change. And as for the text of the change um, of the the ordinance change. Um, in subsection B, it says that no camper, motorhome, or trailer shall be parked on any street for more than 24 hours except as follows. And I want to know that, I want to know how camper or motorhome is defined. Um, some of the council members before this kind of got to that point of like, does a van count? Because you, you can convert a van into a RV title, but most people don't. And so then those vans, which are clearly RVs, um, wouldn't be affected. And those are the more expensive ones that people aren't actually living in, um, but they're more for vacationing. And um, for part one of subsection B, um, it says, it so it restricts campers, motorhomes, and trailers, except um, when located on a, directly on a street frontage of a single family or multifamily dwelling, the vehicle's registered owner for a consecutive period of 40 hours or less. I think it's unnecessarily restrictive um, it's inequitable, and um, apparently there's some equ equity tools that you could use. Um, I didn't know about that, but you should definitely use those. Um, it, like it, the most obvious one is that not everybody has a private driveway to move their RV to. Um, so I have three asks now. Um, one is that since staff said that this isn't directed at people living in their cars, you could um, make this only apply to commercial vehicles. And then you can, like you talked about, you can deal with the issue of people living in their cars at a later time. Um, that way it doesn't unduly burden them. 
Um, the second ask is that you can write the way it's written is that the, a person can't move their car within the city limits at all. Um, and that just seems ridiculous because um, you're literally like forcing people out of the city at that point. And Boulder has a long history of exporting our housing issues to the suburbs, the L-Towns and Broomfield. Um, and this would be continuing that. And finally, my final ask is that um, you do what Rachel Friend suggested and you delay this until you have your study session next week and you talk about homelessness, um, especially the, the point about how a, an RV couldn't park for an hour um, seems ridiculous and seems like an obvious mistake of how the law is written. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And finally, Jennifer Sun. So Sarah, do we have Jennifer on the line? We do, bear with me for one moment. Sure, just making sure. Okay, she should be queued up to speak now. Okay, hello? Hello. All right, um, I first, I wanna say that the this ordinance I feel is extremely discriminatory against blue collar small business individuals who are most likely the class of people to own a utility trailer. For daily work purposes, these people do much of the regular service work in our community and this ordinance is sending the clear message that Boulder does not welcome them as part of our community to live here. Um, as a community, we all benefit from the services these <coughs> small business owners provide. Um, but we can't seem to accept them as part of our community without saddling them with burdens to be able to stop them from being able to do their job. Um, I don't understand why we want to make Boulder less diverse than it already is. Um, I feel like it's unfair for the people that are in landscaping as well because so they can only park for a total of 72 hours and then never park again. So are they not allowed to work in Boulder again, ever? Um, environmentally, storing your trailer in a different place than you live will increase the need to drive more to get your trailer, causing more pollution and more traffic. Private storage is pretty scarce and expensive, thus, um, pushing people out of our city even more. Um, the definition of campers, just like the previous speaker said, can be interpreted in many different ways. Um, how are you guys gonna determine if a camper, how are you gonna determine what a camper is? Are you going to include vans? And I think that's, all I have to say. Great, thank you, Jennifer. With that, we will bring the public hearing to a close and bring this back to council. So I see Junie's hand up. Thank you, Sam. I just have a few questions and I wanted to start first by saying that I understand, you know, what some of the speakers discussed expressed over the fact that the law may be discriminatory against people without residence. But I also understand the need to protect homeowners because people care about who's coming in and out of their neighborhoods and care about who they, their neighbors are. I don't have kids, but I can just imagine that people do care about these things. Um, but I'm also confused about the parking and the frontage road. And I think I would like to ask, um, I would like to ask Tom about, um, is there a place, can we parse out the ordinance more where, is there a place we can allow people to park? Maybe, because I think one of the speaker mentioned on Pearl Street, uh, the business district, because for me, when I was thinking as to why and the purpose, because it is true. It is discriminatory, but because of, you know, when we think of, okay, if people say, okay, we want to know who's coming in and out of our community, 
but at the same time, what can we do to have some level of equity or balance? So that's my question. And then I have another question. Um, and I also understand that the extension is helpful for one group of people. Um, so is there a way we can disconnect the home ownership to the parking? So I guess that would probably undo the purpose somehow. But to me, I just think this is so one-sided. Is there a way we can make it more equitable? And that's what I'm thinking. Um, parking on Pearl Street or some other place for people, because I just feel this is way too one-sided. So, Judy, I want to just push back a little. The intent is not to keep people out of neighborhoods. The challenge that we have is businesses who are running their businesses with vehicles who park them in front of their homes. And then um, we, we, had, we had a 24-hour limit. Neighbors would complain, and then people would just move in an inch and say, well, it moved. It's not in the same place. So that's the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, and I assume that people could, in fact, complain because they don't like an RV parked in front of their house although I'm not aware that, that, that we've seen a lot of those complaints. The ones I've seen are mostly about commercial vehicles. And so we could limit it to those, um, as somebody suggested. We could make lots of changes. Um, but the, so, so it, this is a policy consideration for council. Um, it's, unusual, it's somewhat unusual to have an ordinance that's come before council several times and then have this level of debate. So if you want to suggest changes, we can make changes. It's your ordinance. Uh, and you shouldn't pass it unless you're comfortable with it. Uh, but it's not intended as discriminatory, and I don't believe it's applied in a discriminatory manner. Okay. Um, next, we have Adam and then Mary. Thanks, Sam. Um, my question, it's not exactly a question, it's just more of a statement. Um, I noticed pretty much almost all the examples were some type of recreational vehicle, I'm not saying that that's the most complaints we get, but um, in that slide, it showed mostly recreational vehicles. And Adam, they were mostly commercial vehicles. Really? Yeah, I thought, I mean, it was, there was the shave ice truck. Sandra, can you put, can we put that slide back up? I mean, I, I saw only the shave ice truck. Uh, I don't have access to it. Sarah would have to do that. I think it's probably, it's a mix of both. Um, and I don't know what the ratio is. Uh, you know, we've got Chris and Leo that might be able to address that question if they want more. By my count, it's six to two there, but that's not my point. My no. point being, um, one of the interesting things that COVID has brought about is people living outside in their trailers uh, because they're social distancing. And that's a very specific reasonable thing in my mind that we wouldn't want to remove people from a situation of parking when they're actually trying to protect society at that moment. So um, I have a personal problem with the RV usage, especially right in this moment. So I might ask council to consider that part of it, um, maybe separating that. Yeah, of course, as Sandra points out, generally we charge the most specific charge and if there was someone were living in a in a car or an RV outside their outside the house on the street, that would violate the provision against living in a motor vehicle, and which you've asked to address next week, and you can. But we could certainly do that. Thank you, Mary. Uh, sorry, Adam, were you finished? This is yeah. Uh, I'll I'll just say one more thing since I've had the floor real quick. I, I totally understand the shave ice truck there for nine months out of the year doesn't make much sense, but it still doesn't feel exactly like we hit it the nail on the head with this yet. Thank you, Mary. I, actually, I think Chris Jones wanted to respond. Chris, did you want to say oh, something? Okay. Yes. Sorry, Chris Jones, Deputy Director of Community Vitality. Um, we oversee the parking enforcement team, and so they're the folks that, that pour over the ordinances that, that you all approve um, to determine how they should enforce these rules. Um, and so I just wanna clarify for the team that the way they would interpret this um, is overnight parking. So if someone does come and park an RV on Pearl Street during the day to go shopping and that's their preferred vehicle, um, that is not an activity that would be ticketed, um, a $25 ticket. Um, 
for first 48 hours of, of parking. If they do stay overnight and our officers discover that the vehicle stayed overnight um, or if there's a complaint, that's what would trigger their um, use of this ordinance. If the complaint has anything to do with someone living in the vehicle, those, those ordinances are not enforced by the parking enforcement team. That gets referred to the police department. I, I did also want to add that there are definitions in our code for camper, trailer, and motorhome. Um, so those issues are addressed as well. Very good, thank you. Mary, your hand is now down to me. Do you have a comment? Um, I did, um, I did. It was still technically up. Okay. Um, so one of the speakers said that um, you could, a vehicle could be parked um, on the street for 72 hours, then never again. Is that true? I, I, no. not, not the way I would read the ordinance, no. Okay. Um, so again, I guess, well, if I'll wait till we move to comments. Uh, I, I think we're kind of there. So um, given, given that it's 11 o'clock, I think uh, this is, we brought it back to council so you can make comments now if you'd like as well. Um, so I think we should just pass this tonight um, or go ahead and vote on it. And if it doesn't pass, it doesn't pass, but I think we should go ahead and vote on it. Um, and then as we spoke about earlier, is to include both of these ordinances in the study session memo by addendum or however um, staff um, can get it done. And um, that in the interim that um, we, if we have questions about each ordinance that we talk speak with the appropriate staff members to better understand them and um, and to consider what changes we might want to make, um, and then um, have our conversation next um, Tuesday, and make changes that we might want to make to one or both ordinances. Then um, that way we're looking at it in a more holistic manner, with the chance to consider what will be in front of us next week, rather than right now. Um, to Rachel's point, is you know, we'd be looking at it with that topic in mind. So that's my proposal. Um, and I'd, I'd like to make sure that it isn't being discriminatory, but I can't tell right now because we don't have the other ordinance in front of us and I don't understand the, um, how the most specific ordinance is applied as Sandra apply, um, mentioned and so, I just think it makes a lot more sense to have a holistic conversation next week. Thank you, Mary. Rachel? Yeah, I, I wanna say I do understand um, for the attorneys on the line how frustrating it must be to have this um, lengthy discussion um, and, and I'm empathetic to, to that frustration. Um, and I'm still concerned though just about um, the equity of sort of somebody who's wealthy and maybe has a driveway that can fit eight cars versus somebody who's working class and has a trailer. And if I'm understanding it correctly, like let's say that I have a, a trailer for a landscape business and I want to take a week off and I don't have a driveway or street frontage, like I can't, uh, I can't leave it on the street on, on my block. Right. Right. In that scenario. Right. The, the idea is that the, it goes into a storage facility because it's a business. It's in a residential um, neighborhood when it is a, a commercial, more of a commercial vehicle. Yeah, I get it. I, I guess I just it seems like it's going to hit working class businesses harder than um, wealthy business owners and, and wealthy homeowners. Um, so I would like to see it, it run through a, a, the equity tool. And I'm mindful that it sounds like what we're trying to do is take something that was 24 hours, which was worse, and raise it up to 72 hours, which is better. So I'm, 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 that, that's not lost on me. 
it just seems like if we're if we're doing it, we would want to do it right and then not have to go revisit it and create more work for you. So I would also like to offer that the language that allows a permit to be issued does open up the opportunity to work through some of our processes similar to the neighborhood permit parking program that uh, we could explore options for folks that want to store these types of vehicles longer term. We could work through our processes to create permits to allow that. It would, there would just be some charge for it. Um, we, we charge for a lot of different types of smaller vehicle parking in our higher demand um, neighborhoods. And so this, the, the way the ordinance has been written could possibly um, open up uh, that opportunity. Adam? Yeah, Sam, um, I did have one follow-up. It wasn't really clear once your time is expired, how long does the vehicle have to leave before it could be back in a similar place again? If, is that specified anywhere? No, it, it isn't specified. Okay. So, so I, I want to jump in here and point out just a couple of things that I've been thinking about as we get through. Currently, you can't park a passenger vehicle on the street for more than 72 hours. So for what it's worth, the trailers aren't being treated much different than um, other vehicles in the sense that there are limits to being able to park any kind of a personal vehicle on a street frontage. Um, so let me ask and make sure I'm right about that. Chris, isn't there a limit to private vehicles and how long they can be on the street? Correct, there is a 72 hour limit. Got it. And, and so this is not that out of line with kind of our current practice of regulating the amount of time that the public street parking areas can be used for any purpose. In this case, the commercial vehicles has kind of inspired it, but the, the point being that <clears throat> if we wanna talk about equity lenses and the, the, the differential impacts and things of that nature, we're gonna to need to go probably beyond the trailers and RVs and talk about everything, which is why I'm kind of inclined towards Mary's suggestion, which is go ahead and get this definitional problem solved and, and put you know, in, into effect. And then let's have a conversation holistically that talks about everything that we care about, which really isn't just RVs. Um, and, and I will say further that the way I read this is that if you want to park a trailer overnight on the street, you can find a spot to do it, but you're going to use it the next day for work. You can go out, pick up your trailer and, and go, and you won't be in violation of any law, uh, particularly if you come back and park it a different part on the street. Um, so at least the way the 72 hour limit on personal vehicles is enforced is somebody comes by and chalks your vehicle tire. And so if they see that the vehicle has not moved and the chalk mark is in the same spot after 72 hours, then I think that's when a ticket can come out. So um, I, I guess I'm pretty inclined to what Mary has suggested, which is the subject is a lot bigger than this small fix that the, um, <clears throat> the staff has brought to us. So I, I would see moving ahead with this, but if, and it's also a parking thing, right? It's enforced by, parking staff <clears throat> and not police. And so it is yet again different in the sense that the intention here is not that you're preventing people from living in a vehicle so much as you're dealing with the parking issues around public streets. So I, I feel like, you know, there has to be some regulation about parking on public streets. Otherwise we end up with abandoned vehicles all up and down street frontages and, and when do they get towed and, and how does that look? So I guess it's my inclination to support Mary's suggestion, vote on this tonight one way or the other, and then make sure it's included as a subject of, of questions and conversation at the study session. So Mark? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna support what you said, Sam and, and Mary's suggestion. Uh, I think it's a reasonable way of proceeding. Uh, let's clear up the amb ambiguity in the statute today, and we can have a more far-reaching conversation next week on larger topics. Okay. Um, I don't see any other hands, so this would be a good time for a motion so we can see if there's support 
or whatever the motion will be. Um, Mary, do you want to make a motion? Sure. Um, I just need to bring up the motion language. Um, yeah, and I see it on page one or two of the packet. Yeah. There it is. Um, all right. Um, I move that we adopt ordinance 8402, amending section 7 624, all night parking of commercial vehicle, camper, or motorhome, or trailer prohibited, BRC 1981, and setting forth related details. Um, I got that's motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Let me get my window up here. I see no hands. And so, Debbie, I think this is a roll call vote. Yes. Um, Mayor Weaver? Aye. Aye. Council Member Yates? Yes. Young? Yes. Brockett? Friend? No. Joseph? Yes. Nagel? Yes. Swetlick? Nay. Wallach? Yes. Mayor, the motion passes. Very good. Thank you, staff, for the presentation. And uh, we'll be revisiting the larger subject next week at the earliest. So, okay, let me pull up my script here. So, Debbie? Um, next on the agenda is matters from the city attorney, which is an update, update on the Excel settlement discussions. Sam, do you want to have unanimous consent to waive the rules and continue the meeting past 11 o'clock? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I'll ask for a motion to extend the meeting. So moved. A second. Is anyone opposed to extending the meeting? Seeing none, it passes unanimously. Sarah, do I have control? You can either request control, and I can give it to you, or I can advance your slides at your verbal command. Actually, I'm not seeing how to advance if request control. So, would you go ahead and advance the slides? Sure, happy to do so. Thank you. Sorry, Sarah. There aren't that many. No worries. I don't see puppies, though. No, no puppies. So, this is a, a, a periodic report on the good negotiations we're having with Excel. Sarah, could you go to the next slide? Yeah. So, uh, we've had 20 meetings uh, from April 20th to, through today. Uh, Bob, Sa Sam, and Alice, I believe, have attended six meetings thus far. Uh, since April 17th, there have been additional one to two meetings for each for planning and debriefing. Uh, two weekly meetings for the team started on May 25th. This week, we had two meetings scheduled. We're, go we're having two or three meetings each week. Can we go to the next slide? So we've completed our community engagement process. Uh, we had a fairly good turnout at the, the four here meetings. Uh, we had 248 total people, 174 unique individuals. Uh, we had 84, 88 speakers, 44 of them were unique individuals. Uh, so some people spoke twice. Um, we got a wide range of comments. Uh, we have a, um, can we go to the next slide? Uh, so comments about the franchise, uh, other agreements that we should have with, engage, in, with Excel, uh, how we should engage with the community, uh, the future of municipalization, uh, Excel's role as a partner. Uh, our team did a great job of taking notes. Those notes can be found at, at bouldercolorado.gov, local power, and then slash working with Excel Energy, or if you just Google Excel negotiations, local power, it will come up. Um, and so, so you can read detailed notes on what, what the feedback we got, which is extensive and which we have incorporated into our negotiating positions. Next slide. So the key elements that we're still looking at are the carbon goals. And we, our, our team has looked at them um, that, that basically right that we have a lot of questions that we're still working through 
uh, we'll have a more detailed report uh, in this study session coming up. Um, the distribution system planning, uh, we, the issue there is how, how certain we can be of the system planning that we'll have. Um, undergrounding, we're working that through. Uh, we, we still have a lot of issues about information sharing, what they'll tell us and when they'll tell us. Um, we ha we uh, have a tentative agreement on the right to terminate after five years. Um, and then the biggest challenge for us is if we terminate after five years, how do we structure it so that we uh, have an ability to restart? And that that termination after five years is really the, the only enforcement mechanism we have um, to make sure that Excel complies with the agreement. Um, so these are challenges. The negotiations are difficult. Um, I would be reluctant to, to, to make any predictions one way or another about whether we'll be successful or not. The challenge will be trying to uh, get an agreement that uh, council members will feel sufficiently comfortable to recommend to the community. So we're still working at that and we'll continue to update council as we go. And that's the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, <clears throat> Debbie. Is there council discussion or is this simply a presentation and moving to the next issue? Uh, I, I believe it was just an update. Um, okay. Let okay. me check. I didn't see any hands up when I looked last, so I don't see any hands. Are there any questions? Council okay. would like that. Uh, Mark has a question. Yeah, uh, just, just a quick question. Um, uh, without going into too much detail, can you characterize the right to terminate after five years as um, unconditional, or is it the kind of thing that's going to lead to an immediate litigation? It's unconditional in, in our current drafts. Yeah. Okay, I appreciate that. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Okay. Moving on to matters from the mayor and members of council. We have um, item, the first item is review process for the city manager, city attorney, and the municipal judge. Great. And I think I'll, Mary, are you good to go on this one? Yeah, um, real quickly, um, two points. Um, one is that um, there will be no evaluations for our three employees this year um, for reasons of um, budget reasons and um, the extra workload due to um, COVID. And um, so we've, we've had a conversation with, uh, Sam and I have had a conversation with all three um, of our employees and um, they're supportive of this. Um, and so that means that we will have some time uh, between now and next year's evaluation to consider changes to the process. Um, this is my first time being on this subcommittee, but as I understand it, um, the process um, could use improvements. And so we will um, look to accomplish some improvements between now and then. And um, we certainly welcome comments from um, from Tom and Jane and Linda as to how we might be able to improve that. And we'll be working with um, human resources staff to recommend um, a uh, better process. And so what I've just outlined is actually a recommendation from Sam and I as the subcommittee, and we just need to have the support of the rest of council in order to ratify it. Yeah, and I'll just say, <clears throat> I haven't been on this subcommittee that long either. I've done two cycles of the evaluation and um, it was very difficult last year for a variety of reasons. Um, and in the process of speaking with <clears throat> our employees about this, um, it, it is clear that the process hasn't worked very well uh, on balance. And so whether or not we, you as council members choose to accept our recommendation for no evaluations or we wanna talk about that further, that's fine. But I will say 
from my perspective, the, the process that we've been using in the past really needs a, a thorough review top to bottom. And the, the um, HR department is totally willing to support that uh, over the next year. So I've got two hands up. I've got Bob and Rachel. Um, so I, um, I understand that there may be some, well, I, I, I agree, first of all, that the process, at least last year's process was not very good and, and, and we need to, to improve upon it. Um, and I also understand that there may be some constraints um, in the HR department or others that might be administering the evaluations. Um, I'm a little reluctant to have no evaluation, however. Um, and so I'd like to suggest that we have some form of evaluation, some form of communication by council to those three employees about our thoughts on how things are going, areas for improvement, uh, you know, congratulations, disappointments. I, I just don't want to go for 24 months without that type of formal feedback. Um, this has nothing to do with, with salary adjustments. This just has to do with feedback. Uh, and I'm just wondering if we could put together something that maybe is quick and dirty where council members can weigh in. Um, you know, it could be on a survey, it could be open-ended questions uh, that could be um, collected by somebody in HR um, and shared with our um, three employees with, with um, some delivery by the committee, which I think is Mary and Sam, but I, I just, I'm reluctant to have no evaluation at all this year. Um, and I'd just be curious to see if other council members share that. Got it. And Rachel's hand was up and then went away and came back. So I'm going to go to her next and then Mark. So Rachel. Yeah, I don't know why the hand went away. So I put it back up. Um, I'm obviously new to this. Uh, and so one question is this, has this been done before? And I guess in part two of that question, I, I assume it's okay under the charter to not evaluate. To the best of my knowledge, there's no charter requirement to evaluate. And um, to the best of my knowledge, in the time I've been on council, we've always done an evaluation. But the form has changed and the way the data is compiled and presented has changed over that time. But I can't remember us in the past having done zero evaluation. And I will add that in the past, we haven't been in the kind of situation that we're in that we find ourselves in right now. There's no doubt it's been a hell of a year and uh, not, it, nothing's uh, out of bounds in terms of, of uh, needing to be changed. So I, I don't disagree with that. I just wondered if this is like, unprecedented and if there's something that requires us to give an annual evaluation. I guess that's- um, I will say this, that in con our conversation with, um, with one of our employees, um, they did comment that um, when they speak to their colleagues from other cities, um, they're the only one that actually gets an annual evaluation. When mm -hmm. that what we do annually is a rare thing. So um, just conveying that information. I appreciate it. And, and maybe my question is bigger, like 